international end time ministry of churches where the young people and the old can walk together and be a blessing and be a change for the communities and the nations. There's a multi-generational walk. Not only will we have more, but our descendants, our children, our children's children. That's both our natural children and our spiritual children. Guys, some of you have worked long and hard to grow up those spiritual children. They're in your churches, at the end of your fingertips, and you're starting to see stuff happen. I want to tell you, God's got a plan. We got a prophesied over a couple um, a few years ago, 2017, up in Joburg, um, and I prophesied certain things, but one of the things I prophesied over this particular couple, I said, I saw the Mediterranean. And I don't know what I said. I mean, I said a few things. I go to Spain, I was in Spain a few weeks ago, I go to this thing and this man comes up, hello, Tanya! So I said, oh, hello! <laughs> uh, I don't know who he is. And he says, you prophesied over me. I said, oh, yes, man, 2017, you said this, you said this, you said this. And you said that I'd be at the Mediterranean, you said about the Mediterranean. So he and his wife, have gone to Alicante in Spain to support a church plant. And when they look out their window of their flag, what do they see? The Mediterranean. I was like, what? I said that? <laughs> I don't really remember it, but yeah. I want to tell you, you don't know what you're investing. That might have been the first time you heard that. And others had to say, some, yes, he had to go through a process. But I want to tell you, you don't know nations. They will inherit the nations and inhabit. Make the desolate cities inhabited. There are, now listen to this. Listen to this, are you listening? In Europe alone, in Europe alone, there are 250,000 cities or towns that don't have an evangelical church. Look at the person next to you and ask them, when are you going? <laughs> Spain, Spain has 900 cities and towns needing a New Testament church. There is a New Testament church, a Hillsong church in Madrid of 700 people, of which only 20 people are Spanish. But we're pushing through. There's doors that are opening. And that's something of what the prophetic does. It shows you there's life beyond just your own town, your own little home group, your own little church. There's life beyond. And God wants us to walk into it. Isaiah 58, uh, verse 12, in the New Living Translation, it says, Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you'll be known as a rebuilder of walls and restorer of homes. Friends, as we trust God for the more, as we step out and speak a life, I'm getting so excited, sorry. <laughs> as we speak a life and future and a hope over people, some of them will be stirred and encouraged and prepared to rebuild ruined cities for the gospel. Where once God was celebrated. Where now worldly influences that have destroyed the Christian identity. You just have to look at Turkey. Seven churches of revelation are situated there. There is no evidence of them anymore. They're ruins. Because something happened. People did not hold on to what God was saying. Are you listening? Greece, Italy, Germany, UK. Much of history, much Christian history, but not much evidence of a church that is alive and thriving. Except that, through the prophetic, God is sending people. The army is going in. Where we were evangelized, we are now going. I want to tell you, I want to tell you that as South Africans and Africans, 
God is doing something. Through, back into those areas where the church, in a sense, is in ruins. I want to tell you, and listen, I know God is well able to watch over His Word to perform it. But God wants to use you and I. Maybe you're not going to ever get there. Maybe all you can do is pray over those situations. Maybe all you're going to do is prophesy over the people. You hear somebody's, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm immigrating. Can I get out of this country? You say, oh, can I pray for you? And then you start prophesying what they're going to carry when they go. Are you stretched a little today? To go beyond where you've been before in the spiritual, in the natural. Maybe you've got to buy, book a ticket to Cameroon. Met a guy on the train who was from Cameroon. Maybe you've got to book a ticket and go up the road to Joburg. Or across the town to Anlazi or to, I don't know, Tonga Rocks. Let's advance the kingdom through showing people, churches, and nations their preferred future in God. Amen. Thank you so much, Tanya. You've blessed us with that word. You've equipped us, you've grown us. I love what you say that God wants to speak to us in a way that is easy for us and is closer to us than we think. It's closer to us than the air that we breathe. He wants to work through us. Amen. Thank you so much. So we are going to Spain. <laughs> We're going to Germany. <laughs> We're going to Joburg. Praise the Lord. Thank you so very much. Are we still glad to be here, Mazarwan? Still expectant? Well, it's my honor and privilege to welcome our next speaker, Ricardo Braxhell who's originally from Emelo, but he has recently moved to Joburg in Gauteng three weeks ago, three weeks ago, to plant a church in Krugersdorf. Yes. We're planting churches! The gospel is advancing! Welcome, Ricardo. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What an honor, what a blessing. Thank you so much, Moed. I met her a couple of months ago. Also, the prophetic opens doors and it allows connections to happen. So I'm, I'm standing here, somebody was saying a product of this meeting, I'm a product of prayer. I'm saved because I had a mom, on, mom and dad on their knees praying for me when I was in high school. I would wake up sometimes three in the morning and I would find my mom or my dad in the living room praying. And my brother, my sister, and myself, we all served Jesus passionately because we had a mom and a dad in a secret place. And this, this, is, the, this is the answer. It is, a, it is a people on their knees. It is on the, in the book of Acts. What caused the heart of God to move was a people what? praying and a people seeking the face of Jesus even though they were in fear. So, thank you, Moy. I'm, I'm very honored and I'm, I'm so blessed by, by everything that's been, been said. So, yes, my name is Ricardo Broxham. I'm Afrikaans. I come as project from Ermelo Af. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I, I moved to Krugersdorp three weeks ago. God called me there. And I'm getting married at the end of this year. But, yes. My fiance was going to be here this morning, but she's finishing off her life in Poch. She's still a student. She's finished this week. And unfortunately, she couldn't make it. But uh, there is something that I feel very strong in my heart for this morning, and especially for the prophetic and God's character and nature. We have to respond to Him. So there is this this word, the first thing I saw when I came in, I thought the prayer meeting was here this morning, and I was like, where's Moy? She's not here. But God is. <laughs> but if you, if you had to get this phrase in your Bible, it's, it's repeated four times in the Bible. First, in the Psalms and Deuteronomy, God is fire. OK? 
Okay. Then we go to John. God is spirit. Then we go to the letter of 1 John. God is light. And probably one of the most important statements written on the character of God is in 1 John chapter 4. It says, God is love. God is fire. He is spirit. He is light. He is love. This is who he is. And Jesus came to reform our ideas about his father. We wanted to paint him in a way, but Jesus came and he reformed ideas about who we saw the father is. He said, I do nothing except what I see the father do. So Jesus came to display the fullness of God. 1 Colossians 19 says Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily and through his sacrifice he reconciled us back to God. So God is as close to us now as he was to Moses in the burning bush. We have to believe in the sacrifice of Jesus. God is as close to us now as he was to any God encounter in the Bible. He's as close to us today, even closer because of the sacrifice of Jesus. So, out of 12 apostles, there was one entrusted with a revelation. The Apostle John, who is, I, want to, I wrote this down in the prayer. Out of 12, one was entrusted with a revelation, the end time prophecy. I have this theory that he's more a prophet than he was an apostle. Why? There was one thing more important to John even than his own name. It says, I am the beloved of Jesus. His identity was more being loved by God than it actually was his personal name. And you, there's something about the love of God that opens the supernatural. Because it's Jesus saw the, sh the sheep that were like without a shepherd. And his heart was moved by compassion. And he broke, he broke a young boy's bread and he multiplied it. It was the compassion of Jesus that was the doorway to multiplication. Okay? Then we see Jesus crossing the Lake of Galilee. And there's a man demonized by a legion of demons. That's six to seven thousand demons. And his heart was moved by compassion. He frees this man by his love. This man wants to join Jesus and he says, No, you will be a, a testimony in a ten city region of how the Lord was compassionate towards you. And that, that is, I don't know, it is. Can we go to expand? There's a slide that is expand. That is where encounter is the foundation. And why does God want to encounter us? Because He loves us. He loves us. Our number one reason why God created us is for us to be loved by Him. My natural response to His love will be to love Him back and to love others back. So when I look at somebody, it's not me wanting to prophesy and wanting, it's me wanting to love you in that moment. This is what the spiritual gifts are. The spiritual gifts are the hand of God. Picking you up from brokenness, encountering you with his presence, but bringing you back to his bosom. So we can be like John and lay our heads against his bosom. Because Jesus was the one who came from the Father's bosom. 1 John, John 1 18. And that's the reason he could reveal to us the Father. So the gifts are the Father's way, it's a tool that he uses to reveal his character to broken people. A miracle. The intention is for us to come in contact with His love. The result is a prophecy. The result is a healing. The result is a miracle. But the core of everything is God wants to show you He loves you. That is the core. He wants to be, I love you so much. I sent you my son to reconcile you back to me. This stirs my heart. It's the love of Jesus. So encounter, Moy asked me to share a testimony and, and I want to share a testimony really quick. There's a lot of things that I want to say, but there's not time. Encounter is the foundation. Um, 
my fiance and I, we were ministering at a youth group earlier this year, and we were sharing. This is a message we carry in our hearts for the last year, and it's increasing, and we don't want to speak on anything else. It's He loves you so much, your response will be to return to that love. And that's where Jesus calls us. Turn back to the love you had for me at first. If you know how much He loves you, then the natural response will be to love Him back. It's as simple as that. That is the gospel. So in this meeting, there was a girl who was 17 years old and she didn't believe in Jesus. She said, Jesus doesn't exist. And we're just sharing on the love of God. Because children realize how much He loves them, miracles start happening. Like, kids, we, we are witnessing miracles, but the message is Jesus. And she comes and she's like, I don't believe in Jesus. And we're like, are you for real? Like there's miracles, just open your eyes. He's revealing himself. And the temptation in that moment was to argue. But really, to walk in the spirit and to love her in the moment, it was brokenness speaking. So this girl is an Afrikaans speaking South African citizen in high school. And we were like saying, hey, listen, we just want to tell you he loves you. Even though you don't believe in him, even though you're angry at him, he still loves you. That is not going to change. And we, like we just ministry. And the next moment she allows us to pray for her. And it was revealed to us by prophecy that she did a satanic ritual. She's a witch for Satan. And she did this two years ago. She's 15. She did this two years ago. So here comes this girl. She's broken. Her response to that brokenness is, like, I, I just need help. And her help she got in the enemy's camp. Which wasn't help. Um, when my life changed, one of my mentors told me, because I came from brokenness, he said, you don't get bad people, you get broken people. Broken people do bad things. Okay? That is why the message of love is so powerful. And she, she was saying, you can only pray for me if my life will change tonight. Because I desperately need it. And we, that's a pretty scary request. But thank goodness it's not us who's going to change our life. Her life was transformed that night. She was delivered. She's set free. She's in a program. She's getting pastoral counseling. And it's, it's just this message. She's not the only teenager we saw that got exposed to witchcraft in this year. There's actually a lot of things happening on TikTok, live TikToks. What we found, I know there's people that go into schools, share the gospel, but on the on the porches, the room of discussion is the witchcraft is more common than the gospel. And that's a problem. Because what the enemy is busy doing, he's sending 14 and 15 year olds who's apparently called to be the next generation of spiritual healers or some gormas or whatever. And he's sending them into the schools. And schools are actually allowing that, the enemy. But we have to start raising the next generation of 14 and 15 year olds, prophetic teenagers who can walk into the high school and pray for the sick and they will recover, cast out the demons and they will be set free. That is, what, that is our strategy for what God is busy doing in South Africa, for what he wants to do, even in Acts. Everywhere the gospel came and penetrated in a new area, there was Simon the sorcerer, or there was the girl who had divination in Philippi. So already we can see God is going to do something in high schools because the enemy is already moving there. So we can know that there is a move of God going to happen, even in primary schools. I'm speaking a lot. Okay, Revelation. Encounter, Revelation, Expansion. This is the three bullets that I want to speak about. Encounter is God's desire for intimacy. He walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. When Jesus called the twelve, he said, hey, walk with me. Walk with me. That is the call. It is, it's doing it with God. My encounter leads to your encounter. 
we are encountered by the presence of God. A prophecy is a God encounter. Healing is a God encounter. It's Him revealing His nature to you. So 1 John 1 verse 3 to 4. John says, I have seen and I have heard. That is encounter. And now I'm telling you so you can experience it along with us. This experience of communion with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Our motive for writing is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too. Your joy will double our joy. The message also says, your, uh, my joy will become yours. So every person who's holding the mic today can testify that you have encountered. God has encountered you. You are leading others there. So your testimony, if you're in high school, if you're at your work, or whatever it is, this can be the foundation. God has encountered me with His presence. But I testify with my mouth. So you, my joy, my present reality in my relationship with God can become yours. Even though you're a Satanist, even though you're so far away from God, even though you are broken, whatever it is, that my joy can become yours. And then, so why encounter? God's desire is intimacy. And I've said this from the garden to Jesus calling his disciples. His heart has always been for us to walk with him. Signs are the fruit. His true intention is relationship. So that, that's why I said the hand of God leads us to the heart of God. So we can be like John to put our heads against the bosom of the Father. I wrote down, are you functioning from a gift or intimacy? If we go to Numbers 12, we can actually see this happening. Miriam and Aaron. They are speaking against Moses. And they say, hey, this Moses, his wife is wrong. And I, I just hear religion in my ears through that statement, looking at outward appearance and not really identifying the heart of somebody. And then, and God calls them in. He calls all three of them in and he says, Miriam, Aaron, I clap hands, prophets. But to a prophet, I reveal myself in a dream or in a vision. But not to Moses. Not like my servant Moses. To him, I speak as a friend. Friendship. And, and here is something that I learned from a very young age. I have functioned from a gift. It is very easy to function from a gift only. But you can function from a gift and feel far away from God and burn out and feel tired and step into performance. It, and, and many times I felt even in my own life it was that thing of, of, of a, it was an identity issue. As a young man wanting to prove myself, wanting to be the most accurate person in the room or, but yet today where, where I stand, I'm probably the least accurate person in the room. But I'm, I'm putting myself out there. I'm stepping up by faith. So last week I felt God call me. So because we've witnessed all these things, teenagers getting exposed to witchcraft on TikTok especially. I've got videos of on my personal account scrolling, seeing tarot card readers, whatever. I'm going hard off the TikTok lives. I've got a very tiny channel. Okay, 500 followers. Last week I felt God call me go live every day. 6,000 people tuned in to my 500 follower account. Partially blind eyes were opening. A deaf ear opened. I can't, I can't explain the amounts of miracles that we're witnessing. People are delivered on TikTok, on a screen like this, getting healed and set free and I'm like amazed. I'm sitting at the back seat witnessing God do what He does. I'm just the voice. My voice, He wants your voice. 
because his voice allows Holy Spirit to witness alongside of you. I can do the natural, but God can do the supernatural. So it's not putting confidence in me or you. It's putting confidence in his ability. And then finally, encounter reveals God's nature. Your encounter will lead to revelation. Your revelation will naturally lead to increase or expansion or extension. I'm finishing off with this. The sinful woman, Luke 7. There's a sinful woman, the town harlot. She comes to Simon the Pharisee's house. Luke 7, 41 to 43. She comes to Simon the Pharisee's house. Jesus happens to be in the house. Okay? Adulterous woman on this side. A Pharisee or a lawyer on that side. She risked her life entering that living room. According to the law, she was she deserved death. This woman risked her life. She didn't only risk her life, she brought an alabaster jar full of uh, Nardus Willy, which came from the foothills of the Himalayan mountains, which could have been her retirement fund. It could have been a children's university fund. She comes and anoints the body of Jesus with that and her tears. And, and we, we all know that story. The Pharisees are like, Jesus, if you are a man of God, like you will know what's happening. This woman is actually very, she's a sinful woman. Jesus responds to that and he says, if you owe 50,000 and somebody else owes 5 million to one person and both are forgiven, who will be more grateful? The Pharisee answers correctly, the one forgiven more. And Jesus said, she was forgiven much, therefore she loves much. What the Pharisee didn't understand is he was just as guilty. They both are sinners. There isn't greater sin or less sin. Sin is sin. What he failed to recognize is who Jesus was. She responded to Jesus risking her life and future because she had a higher revelation that Jesus that he had. And, and that is why revelation naturally leads to increase. So I just want to close with this prayer. If you can participate with me. Just to close our eyes. And we are contending Jesus for a higher revelation of you. Father, open our eyes. Your word says Holy Spirit unveils us and transforms us. Father, we are not rehabilitated. We are transformed into a new creation. Father, we cry out for a higher view of Jesus. Because if I know, if I have a higher view of you, I will respond in worship towards you in a greater level. Father, sacrifice or surrender will mean nothing because you are my exceedingly great reward. Are you blessed? Did you receive something from that? Thank you very much, Ricardo, for reminding us that the gospel has got supernatural power to change hopeless situations. Bless you for that, brother. Uh, we've come to the end of our first session, but before we close, I'd like to invite Anne uh, for just three minutes. Uh, Dan, three minutes. Dan, three minutes. <laughs> amen. Are you blessed this morning? God is good, amen. All the time. I'm going to take you out of your discomfort, amen. Or maybe I should say, take you out of your comfort. Amen. Just a few. We love the uh, morning time you said. A lovely word. Expand, inherit, inhabit. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And uh, our dear brother, I like his, his, his spirit. Amen. Yeah. But you know what? I'm just going to show what. Three minutes, definitely I'll finish. <laughs> Philippians 1 6. While sitting here, Paul says, and I'm certain. Hallelujah. Yeah. That God, who began the good work within you will continue his work until finally finished on that day while Christ Jesus returned. Church, family of friends, remove yourself from comfort. Church is not a comfort place. It should not be your comfort place. I speak from, from, from a mission point of view because my heart and soul is outside. I just come and congregate on a Sunday and gone back outside. Having said that, to put this entire thing 
team and the thing together. It takes time, it takes logistics, it takes finance. I'm saying to you, not with compulsion, but with love. Give with cheerfulness. It is the work of God, and Moi has got a huge thing next year. You will see the unfolding of the vision of this prophetic meeting. It's, it will be youths flooding in from all sides. Young people are going to come in. They will be teaching of Greek lessons to know the word. Because in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the, and the, and the, and the word is God. That's the resource. Amen? So I'm ple pleading to you with love. On the, on the left there's a, I know we should have both, but we, they're not here. You can place whatever you want to place. And you'll pray and we we'll continue again. This is the work of this work. That's more yes. God is placing now. Is that okay? Amen. Amen. God bless you. And I will do this. You can push the boat side. I know we don't have to pay on this thing. Father, we thank you this morning for an awesome, perfect sitting. All your children have come, Father. We know you here. Your angels are here. Your spirit is hovering around us. And some of us, Father, you're going to intimidate us. You're going to not just this morning. And Father, you are setting us to another dimension, to another level. That Lord, you're going to speak to our soul, speak to our spirit. You're going to prepare and get us prepared to do your will, that your, your glory, Father, will shine upon this earth, Father. You said in the book of Psalms that, Father, the heavens are yours and the earth is given to the children. And Father, we are reminded this morning that we are in the beloved and we pray, Father, all the finances that we collect today, it is for your extension of thy kingdom. Father, we thank for those who have given and those who don't have today. But Father, they've given your heart already. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Okay, on the boat, left hand side, you can drop it. And uh, yeah, that's it. So we'll take this opportunity as you come forward uh, with the offering, as Dan has already mentioned. On my left, on my left, and on my right. Just on the left. Okay, let's do it central. Yeah, let's centralize it. Tatinda boya kochesu. Tatinda boya kochesu. Ulunde to. Retu. Tatinda boya ko. Tatinda boya.
decreed in heaven in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We speak freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It is done in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, right now we will be breaking for our break. May we please just say, take our seats for a few minutes uh, just to give these announcements. Jesus is at work. White, making welcome as he's on stage and leading us in this program. Would you put your hands together as I invite to see Kiwe Mazibubo, who will be our MC for the show. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for such an introduction. It's such a wonderful time to be together in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It is such a wonderful time to be together in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, I hope you had uh, a time of refreshing as you're outside and a bit recharged. And we're going to steam straight ahead with our program. And um, in the next at the time we go to just allow the time of the prophetic words to come forth and, um, and since I came this morning it was very clear that the signal is very strong and uh, that the signal is very strong and when the prophets and they come and the signal is strong and uh, the anticipation is the download is going to come and, the, and it's going to be fast and it's going to drop something from the and uh, people are going to receive in such a pace and, and are you excited about that the signal is strong and that is going to come forth this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, give quite a big hope of praise. And we want to welcome the prophetic teams to just come forth to, to go straight into it uh, this morning. And Moy was very direct. He said something that was profound this morning during the time of prayer. That when it is the time for the penalty and the whole crowd is waiting and the goal post are in front of you. This morning the prophet will just go straight for the goal, go straight for the goal, go straight for the kick and, and allow the action of God and the things because the signal is strong so that all the other prophets will get that which God has planted in their hearts to deliver this morning. Let's just welcome the prophets as you come forward for that. Come on. Praise God. you again, the woman that is wearing pink, to understand, what is your name please? Yes. Hi. Yes. 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 I see a daughter behind you. She looks to be in her it's like 20, but it's, it's like a young. It's young. She's young. She's in and out the room. But it's like you cry. You say, Lord, you pray for her salvation. And the Lord is saying, I've heard your prayer. I've heard your cry. It's coming to pass. I would also like to invite Balito. I would love to invite Glen Rich. I would also like to invite the prophetic team. Let's all fill the stage. In the meantime, while we are coming, in, I would love to give. With the, with the Greek lectures that are going to fill in the flavor of the prophetic and also she will be part of it, mentoring me. So I would love her to come and give the feedback, please. Morning. Um, Moi just asked me to share a testimony of really just feedback. Um, but before I do that, I just want to share something. You know, when I think of the prophetic, it is so many things. But the prophetic sets things in motion. 
And if you look at what, the, what that means, that phrase set in motion, it means to kickstart, to set up, to bring about, to trigger off, to put in motion. It means a whole lot. It means to begin a process. And I think that that's really powerful because God needs us as prophetic people to speak so that things can be set in motion. Things can be kick-started. And um, at the beginning of the year, my husband and I, we attend um, a prayer meeting at Ladoman every Wednesday. And we were at a prayer meeting and um, it's just a small group of people. It's early in the morning and we'd finished up the prayer meeting and we said, oh, you know, I'm always having a meeting at Ladoman and we were going to go and attend it. And one of the guys there, Steve, he was like, how come you left me out? I also want to be a part of this. I want to come to the meeting. So um, it was a very last minute spontaneous thing and he came to the meeting. Um, there was a, a group of us at one of the one of the rooms there and on that morning, both Moy and Mark Milton um, prophesied over our friend Steve and they set something in motion. Their words from the Lord set something in motion. some of the countries in Africa. He's joined together with a ministry. He's now immigrating to America in January, fulfillment of the prophetic word. He hadn't been anywhere for ages. And the most amazing thing is that he has, um, his wife has been working in England and he's been working here. They've needed to do that for financial reasons. This opportunity has opened the door for both him and his wife to now join together in ministry after seven years in America and do what God's called them to do. He'll be traveling extensively. And that was a setting in motion that took place in January. So I wanted to share that because God needs us to speak. Because with our voices, we create. And just to wrap that up, I'd also share this with me, which, which was just something so powerful. 25 years ago, I received a prophetic word from um, somebody who came from New Zealand to minister at our church. He didn't know me, I didn't know him, it was just a supernatural encounter and he gave me a word that at the time I did not understand. And when he gave that word, it set something in motion, it opened something in the spirit that was so powerful that within one year after receiving that word, certain issues that it's too detailed to go into, you know, too complicated to go into detail, but around my life, that I was completely unaware of from birth till the age of 30, things that I didn't know were going on behind the scenes. He opened it up. He set something in motion. It was absolutely supernatural. It really, really was. And I felt prompted to send him a letter of thanks this year. And when I did, his words were to me were, I mean, he's traveling extensively. He's working with, I think his name's Maldonado. I don't know what his first name is. I mean, he really has an incredible international ministry. And this is what he said to me. He said, I'm so thankful for this message because all that we do, we do by faith. We never really know. We never get the feedback. We never really know what impact it's had. And for me to be able to give him that, you know, that gratitude that he was obedient to God after 25 years and for, for to have such an impact on him. Um, so yeah, you know, speak it. When you hear it, it is all by faith. It is all by faith. Sometimes you will never know. Sometimes you will know, sometimes you won't. But unless we speak, you know, we, we have that power of love in our tongues and in our mouths to be able to encourage and change the course of people's destinies because we've chosen to be obedient to the voice of God. Come in. I just want to speak today, the first, first thing, and that is what God has prepared on my heart for this meeting, and that is prophetic witchcraft within the church. And I think there's a, there's a tendency of my gift is better than yours. 
we have the tendency of saying mine is bigger than yours. And that's where pride sits in. And we need to be very careful of what the prophetic is. And we as prophetic people are there, one, for purity of word. Not just the word of the scripture, but the word that we speak. Not even, even in casual conversation with other people. It's the purity of our word and it's the purity of what is preached from the pulpit as well. We are the purity gatekeepers. And we need to be very, very strong about that. And I, I just want to encourage you that there is a warning out there. There are things of the new age that are creeping into our church and we need to be careful of it. And we as prophetic people, we need to be very vigilant of what is being preached in our, on our pulpits. But not just that, the ideologies that are creeping into the church that is not, doesn't belong there. Um, uh, and I think Paul in the Bible really strongly talks about when he gets to one of the churches that he has planted and they're preaching a different gospel, he gets very angry with them. And that's the letters that he, has, that he has, sp has spoken to us. That lady with the long black hair, yes, you haven't come here just per chance. You are here for a specific for a reason and there's a divine appointment here for you today. There's, an, there's ears that are opening, there are eyes opening, but more importantly, your heart. Because your heart has been made pain, but I see a lot of pain inside your heart. But this is a day of your change. This is a day of the turning point in your life. This is the day that something's going to really change. It's, as that spoke, there's a kick-off. There's a kick-off, there's a motion. As she spoke about now, there's a motion that's going to, to, to move, to change. And bring a, bring a change in your life. There's going to be many changes, but I see this is the first day. Thank you, Father, as you touch that lady. Thank you, Father, for the pain that is in her life. Thank you, Father, that you're restoring, you are healing, and you're restoring that which you take that the enemy has taken away from you. But may the first day be today of the rest of your life where God is going to be miraculously. Guiding and leading you. In Jesus' name. Thank you. I almost feel like I need to give you this scripture, two scriptures, if you can write them down. It's Luke chapter 1, verse 7. It's Genesis 18, 14. Those two scriptures are speaking about the message Bible says, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Um, I'm sat next to you, and as I was sitting there, I just felt that you need... Well, God was going to change your meekness into a voice. This, um, and this goes for ladies here as well, I felt it for ladies. The culture in South Africa is ladies are silent. But not today, not anymore. The church needs every single person to play its part. You have a specific part that God wants to reveal to you, and it's not going to be quiet. So, for you, <laughs> when you were sitting there just saying, you moved something off of the chair. I didn't see what it was, but we're standing up here, I was like a, a pair of glasses, and I saw you putting these glasses on, and I just felt, you know what, God is going to give you his lenses. He is changing your focus and you're going to be seeing things through his lenses. Not as you've been seeing it. And you're going to see it from a different angle. And yeah, that's just a bit of clarity. I saw you earlier when you first came in and told you how beautiful you looked. Because you did. Um, in the prayer meeting, I just had a picture of a springboard. And I felt that people here would experience a springboard experience. And I think that's for you. Nothing worse than a group of prophets in the room, you know. Shit. <laughs> the lady with the blue jackets. Is it, yes, that's you. What is your name? Nomfundu. Nomfundu, I, I feel like I feel like the way you see yourself and the way heaven sees you are different. I think there's something over you that you don't think you deserve it. And right now, by the Spirit of God, I want to break that. I feel like heaven is saying to you, 
There is a season change coming up, but the first thing that needs to change is the way you think about yourself. Because He has chosen you, He has put you in front, and I, I just say, uh, the sense of disqualification, that has been the strategy the enemy has used over your whole life. To say, but not me, God, it's everybody else. And I feel like God is saying, no, not everybody else. You. We've been praying over the children, and yes, there's a big problem with pornography out there. But the problem is social media, maybe as well. And as I was sitting there, I got convicted. I want to tell my child, no more electronics for you. And then I'm busy with my own. And then my parents come and visit me, and my dad is, oh, these young people who are on the phones the whole time. And over dinner table, he's on his phone the whole time. There's a scripture, Moy might help me where it is, but I think it's in Corinthians. It says, which cup are you drinking from? The cup from God or the cup from Satan? Not saying internet is satanic. There's brilliant things happening on the internet. But where do we spend our time on? Where do we spend our time on? And at the same time, on the internet, I saw a podcast with an Israeli previous minister, or I don't know what it is. And he's like, do you know what? Israel has the answer for weapons. Israel has the answer for that. But Israel also has the answer for the social media thing that we are caught up in. So he has everyone's attention. Now, what is the answer? He says the answer is more than 2,000 years old, 4,000 years old. It's called the Sabbath. So I want to challenge you, our family has taken that challenge, to fast, not of certain, certain social media stuff, but I want to challenge you as we challenged ourselves, to fast 24 hours per week from the telephone. It's not easy. It's not easy because the first thing when I'm bored that I'm grabbing is not my Bible, it's my cell phone. So I want to challenge all of you, because you know what, what we do mirrors to our children what they need to do. And may we all be the example out there. Yes, I might not watch pornography here, but they need to trust what I'm doing on my phone. But let's just break that hold that it has on us, and let's grab another cup and bring that closer to drink from the right cup. So I just wanted to add to that. Um, I was challenged about four months ago. I attended a prophetic um, equipped course, and that really um, changed the traje trajectory of my spiritual walk. And then I was challenged to cut out social media, TV, radio, and only watch um, certain sermons or things that are encouraging, but not sort of scrolling. And it's transformed my, my spiritual life completely. Um, I filled up a whole journal with words that God has given me and scriptures that God has given me. I've been a Christian since I was 14, and um, I've really always struggled to hear his voice. And every now and then I'd hear it, or every now and then, like the one time I got a vision, but it was because I spent all day praying and waiting on God, and I didn't seem to put the two together. And now that I've cut out all of that fluff and all of those other voices, God is speaking to me every second of the day. It's, it's amazing. So if you are sitting there thinking, I, I don't hear from God or I'm struggling, cut out your social media and your TV and all the fluff and you give him time to speak. <coughs> Morning, everybody. You know, I was challenged just now. Um, I was standing in front of you and uh, God challenged me. He said, what do you see? And he went, he took me to Ezekiel 37, verse 5. And he see, and what I saw, I saw a big army of people standing in front of me. And you will say to yourself that some of your things, your situation cannot change or cannot use. Or nothing can be changed of it. But the God, the Lord challenged the prophet Ezekiel and he said to him, Son of man, can these bones live? And he asked the prophet the question. Now that's a prophet. And then he says, prophesy, hear the word of the Lord. And I want to say to you today, 
Hear the word of the Lord. Can your situation change? Yes. Hear the word of the Lord. What does God say of his situation? What happened then? He prophesied. And the spirit came. And the wind came like and brought, brought life into the dryness, into the situations of your life. So I'm going to pray this over you guys right now. Just close your eyes. Heavenly Father, I thank you now, Father, as you've shown me, there is a mighty people standing in front of you. Father, they might not see it yet, but Father, I see it. And Father, I know you see it as well. So Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, you breathe on them. You breathe your spirit, you breathe your power, and your situations, Father. I thank you, Father, that things will start to change as people start to profess the word of the Lord over their situations, over their lives, over their family, Father, that they will not go to hear what opinions are said over the cell phones, but they will come go to you and they'll go to your word and hear what you have to say over their lives. Thank you for this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to speak to that gentleman you are wearing white. If you can wear white shirt, white shirt, yeah. Your name, please. Howard. Howard, I, saw, I just saw you running, and I'm looking at the vision that I saw. That It's like you are, you are four years, five years. And at that time, your voice, you know, was, 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 was that voice, as young as you were. But that your voice, when you say something, everybody will, will pay attention. And the scripture I'm getting now, from that age where I look at that boy, you'll just like... You know, you had those strong leadership character traits at that time. And as you grew up, I feel like there was a point where there was a divine encounter, you know, for you in your teenage years. It's like 15, 16, 17 years. During those times, there was a divine encounter. And the enemy has been stealing and stealing because he knows what, what is the mandate upon your life. And I want to say this scripture upon your life where, where God was, 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 was telling uh, Ananias, say, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and, and before the people of Israel is my chosen. You are God's chosen. No matter what the enemy has been planning, but you are chosen. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you and bring you a paraphrase. I feel like God is calling you beyond the walls of the church. He's calling you out there on the street. Everything that you have experienced was not a mistake. God was cooking, was molding, was shaping his chosen instrument. Um, that young man just behind, the, with the one with the gray shirt. Yeah, you. Um, I just really see that the enemy has been after your identity from a very young age and that you've stood out to the point where you've actually experienced a lot of rejection amongst your friends, amongst a lot of people. But God wants to say he has set you aside. And the setting aside is not the rejection of man because God has set you aside for his purposes and his plans. Your identity is God is about to restore. He's going to place people around you, especially men men, Christian men, to restore your identity because I see the authority that God has given of you. Don't worry about what people think about you or say about you. Even the teasing behind the scenes, they look up to you because God has really called you um, to, uh, to really be who you are, but, but be confident in, in what he has called you to be. And then this lady here, I see behind you, there's been a lot of loss. And I see you you here with a, with, a, with a shirt. And I see um, it's trees that are burnt up. And you've put your hope in so many things. But they have burnt up. But God is declaring a new season over you. And he's saying, let go of the old. Because what I'm declaring over you is a new thing. And the new thing I am speaking to you will prosper. But you need to not look back anymore and determine your identity upon what was. Because God is saying what is coming is far greater than what you can ever think or imagine. I've got two more. Can I go? Um, Ricardo. Um, I, I was in Omelo High School. 
And, and I remember that witchcraft, I can't hear you out of the but I remember that witchcraft was, was prevailing in, in Ermelo, and we were praying for a long time. And I remembered when you were speaking that we were praying and said, God, raise up a generation that will chase out devils. Yeah. And I don't know how old you are. 24. And so I'm 44, okay? <laughs> but anyway, but, but I remember we used to pray that God will raise up. And I felt mine. We used to pray, and we used to say, God, raise up a generation that will chase out the devils. But what I see is not only are you going to plant a church, I see conferences like this, and you will speak, and demons will manifest you without you laying hands on them, because the presence of God is going to come into the place, and people are, are going to manifest and be set free because of the anointing. Just keep your face before Him. And Moy, sorry, I have, a, I have a word. We were praying earlier for, for you, and I saw you. Sister, standing on your knees like this, <laughs> saying, God, give me, give me the inheritance that you have for your people in this place. Give me, and I see your heart was breaking for the Christians, for the church, for the prophetic people, for voices that has not been heard. And God, and then I saw a puzzle, and it had the flag of South Africa on and I saw a piece was removed and God was saying I'm looking on the earth where is the piece missing and I saw it in your hands and God is saying there's a specific thing over South Africa I don't know what it is but something that God wants you to restore in South Africa that the enemy took, took over our nation I, I don't know what it is but that's what I see, and God has specifically mandated you for that. I just want to confirm what you are saying. I think those who are in the prophetic uh, declarations page, where I share a prophetic word about the flag of South Africa, do remember that, that prophetic, that is, that, that is Ted at, the, and on, at, at, at his bottom. But there is something about South Africa. Every prophetic word that God has spoke about South Africa is being full, not that it shall or it will, it is fulfilled in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The message that I'm having is for all of us. I, I, I saw the clouds were moving in a very, very, very fast speed. And as I was looking at this cloud, the Lord to say is changing the prophetic gear. And we have to move faster. And again, what happened is the Lord said to me, to all of you, that with God, even a donkey can speak. With God, even a donkey can speak. And God is saying, he wants to bring the church to the level where they were hearing from the prophet. Because at the moment, people are going to Sangoma, going to, to hear, the church is not playing his role. And God is saying we are limiting him because we believe in our strength. And that is why God is saying with God even a donkey can speak. With God even the stones can also speak. So God is encouraging us all to avail ourselves to him. Say God here am I, I'm available, he used me then we will see the change in our nation. Amen. Amen. Shoot the penalty, one minute. As I see somebody who, whenever they go into the throne room, they always are prostrate. They go face down on the floor and they are flat. And they surrender every time. Every time. And God calls them to sit on their lap and maybe for a moment you sit there but your next instinct is to go flat down, face down, in awe and submission of the Father. But he's, so if that's you, he's saying to you, he wants you to stand up and look him in the face. What you've surrendered, you've surrendered. What you've been set free of, you've been set free of. Don't forget the cross. 
You're in the throne room. You're already there. He wants you to stand up and look at him in the face. Um, I don't often write love letters from the Lord, but this is what I felt, and I wrote it early this morning. Jesus says in John 14, I think it is, in my Father's house are many rooms. He is saying there is space for you. There is a dwelling place for you to remain, a place in the kingdom of God, a safe place where no one can touch or remove you. In the, father, in the Father's house you will meet my Father. He himself loves you. He will teach you his ways. There are tasks to do. I will give them. And the Holy Spirit will carry them out these tasks through you. You will become my disciples. There is space to grow, space to learn, space to exercise your faith. There are many people I want to bring in to the kingdom with your help. The last line, I am glad you are here with me. The trouble with the prophetic is that once we get started, we don't want to stop. Uh, I know, I know, but we've got, we're going to have another opportunity later. I know, I know, it's all catching, eh? So, Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for every single person here. And everyone who's on, on that side as well. Father, we know we're not the only ones. There are people here who could be probably prophesying bigger and stronger and better than what we ever can. But Lord, we thank you that you are in this place. We thank you that you have not stopped speaking to your children. And we look forward to what you've got, even into the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. We lift him higher, 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 and the praises go up, his glory comes down. We lift him high, higher, higher. Can stand just for a His glory, His glory. We lift you high, higher, higher, higher. When the pray, His glory. Just like Moses lifted the snake in the wilderness and those that looked at it were healed. As you prophesied that even Jesus, when all will lift you up, he will bring healing. We thank you, Lord, that even as it's what I said at the beginning, that with our words we create. As we lift you up over our nation, as we lift you up, Lord God, over the nations of the earth, as we are gathered like this prophetically declaring, we lift you up your authority over every single situation, every single moment, and every single experience here. And those that are represented here, we thank you that as your glory descends, you're bringing healing, we thank you, you're bringing restoration, we thank you. You are bringing acceleration. We thank you. You are bringing release, oh God. In the name of Jesus, we bless you, oh Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Can be seated this morning. What a wonderful time as we hear the word of God together. Without any further ado, this was my timer coming through. 
I would like us not to waste any time to welcome on stage uh, Moi as she going to come and share with us this morning. And please give her some, please welcome and love and give her a round of applause as she come this morning. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. God bless you. So my sharing today is about extending your borders. I took it from the scripture in Isaiah 54, verses 2 uh, to 3. Verse 2. Enlarge the sight of your tent, and let your tent cutting stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your ropes and drive your tent and drive your pegs deep. Verse 3. You shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate the cities inhabited. I looked at the word extend. In Hebrew is rakap meaning to broaden, meaning to make room. In this, in this one, 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 one word, it means decluster, if it's possible. There are, there are things that are good for the season, and there are things that are no longer good for the season. And there are things that we need to clear the room for the Lord to put more in that room. So you need to make a room so that God can come in and add and broaden and enlarge. Number two thing I find in that word extend, it's, it's like do not settle where you are. I know that you are counting so many years. You know when people are saying, I've been here for 17 years. And then the question is, was that, it, was, was that the destination? Or you became comfortable of where you are and you, you don't want to you don't want to move. But I feel like the Lord with this scripture is saying, Can you move? You could look at Jesus when he was on earth. He moved from one village to the other village. He never circled in one place. You know why? The great mandate is saying, Go ye there to the nations and make disciples. Is that so? If you were not called to sit in one place, whether you are an evangelist, whether you are a preacher, whether you are a teacher, whether you are a prophet, whether you are, but we are not called to sit in one place. Even in our practical life situation, do not dwell on something that is not producing. Am I prophesying here? If something is not producing, the question is, why are you staying there? If, if the leprous man said, why are we sitting here until we die? If we go back, they will kill us. We were rejected backward. We rather move forward. If we die, we die. But the question is, did they die? There's something that King James say, is, is saying on that passage. He's saying, at twilight, they moved. And, and the Bible says, at twilight, on that other side where they were going, God caused chariots and people there ran away so i want to say to you why are you staying there for 10 years move don't take it where you are instead allow god to stretch your area of influence you are hating people you are full of bitterness you are full of anger because you know why? The, the place where you are does no longer contain your destiny. Move beyond where you are. Do not linger and wait until you are recognized. Maybe you were there just for you to just to be there, not to be recognized and be used. How long you have been there? Write your note, write to yourself. And is there any productivity there? Is there any fruitful there? There is a scripture we love the most. The blessing of the Lord make it rich. It does not add, add any sorrow. If there is a sorrow, the question mark is, are you not supposed to move where you are? And allow God to stretch forward. I'm talking about the gifts. 
I'm talking about the talents. The talents and the gifts that God has given us are not for your family, are not for your friends, are not for your local church, are for the world. Another thing, where is your gift right now? Have you ever take a moment and a time to check where is your talent, where is your gift? Is it where it's supposed to be? Because I've seen that in some other instances, because of troubles, because of challenges, we tend to take our gift and throw them away or put them underneath them. Where is your gift right now? Is, is your gift where it's supposed to be? I love David. As dirty as he was, but he kept on moving with his talent. He kept on moving with his gift. Yeah. Even to a point where he was, he was belittled and looked down upon. Go into the army and give your brothers the lunchbox. He went there. And then when he, when he was there on that ground, he forgot about his dirtiness. He forgot about his low IQ. He forgot about how they look at him. He was fully aware of the sovereign God that was inside of him. Despite his situation and his condition and how people look at him. There are some people here who are in the same tunnel because they keep on looking at one day I will have a million. I want to say a prophetic word over your life. There, not, there is not going to be any million. <laughs> the million will come when you walk in the divine calling that God has called you to be. He said, I can't stand this. His brother said, who are you? Why are you here? You were, you were asked to give us the lunchbox. And he said, and David said, you know what? It's because you are, you are in error. You know, God used the lunchbox for me to divinely connect with my destiny. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is defiling the army of God? I don't care that I've never, I've never been in an army. I'm not educated. I'm illiterate. I can't even speak English well. I can't even speak African well. But God in me is greater than the Goliath that is defiling the army of God. And said, today, the same God that has, uh, that, that, that has been with me in the wilderness, with the lion and the bear, is the same God today that is going to cut the head of Goliath. I'm dirty, I'm illiterate, I'm a rejected thing, I'm not even a, a recognized thing in the faith, but it does not matter. Greater is he that is in me than the one that is defiling the army of God. You need to know your identity. There is a quote here by J.P. Morgan. He's saying, go as far as you can see. And when you get there, you'll be able to see further. <laughs> Prerequisites, see. Prerequisites, move. Prerequisites, do, act on what is inside of you. Remember, all of us here, we are here on earth for a purpose. Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. We are like God. We can create, we can establish, we can unlock, we can lock. There is nothing that would be too, too difficult for us because we carry the, 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 the DNA, the DNA of the creator. He commanded and it stood firm. He spoke and it came to be. We carry that anointing. Soon, after we have done that, soon you shall expand. As far as you can go. As far as you can see. And as far as you can act upon it. That is my quote, Moi's quote. Write in your note, that's Moi's quote. As far as you can go. <laughs> as far as you can see. And as far as you can act on it, because it's pointless to see. There are people in this room that are sitting with 50 prophecies. They prophesy over me, they prophesy over me, they prophesy, but there's no action. But Moe is saying in her quote, as far as you can act on it, that is how far God will take you. What are areas of significance? How? What are areas of significance? Knowing your mandate. Knowing your mandate. What is your mandate? What is your purpose? What God has called you to be? What, go, what is your calling? Some other people, many people are thinking of a calling. They think of a preacher. No, no, we're not talking about that. We are talking about the gifts and the talents that God has given us. 
They like the, 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 there is a high art scripture. This this very last term, Jesus Christ, our example, our apostle, our follower in Mark 138. He's saying, Let us go somewhere else to nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Can I repeat this verse? Let us go somewhere else. Prophetic people go somewhere else. You are known. When you come this entrance door, people are running away because they know that you're going to say to them, you've got a wig. Go somewhere else. <laughs> Nearby villages. <laughs> You are now you're gonna prophesy. So people are running away from you. You know why they are running away from you? It's a signal that go somewhere else where you are not known. So I can preach there also. That is why I have came. The central message of every believer is the gospel. Can I repeat that? It's not prophesying, it's not laying hands. Laying hands is number two, but the central of it all, the central focus is the gospel. The gospel message. There is a scripture that is, that is, that is striking my heart. Matthew 24 verse 14 says the gospel will be preached in all the world. Until that, nothing will happen. <laughs> People are saying, come Jesus, come. He will not come. Until the gospel is preached in all the nations, in all the world, then the end will come. So please, let us not be deceived that Jesus is coming. The gospel, you have reading, you, you, Tanya, you have been reading statistics this morning. It's the fulfillment. So Jesus is not coming. So you better go and preach the gospel, even in your rural area. Go and preach the gospel there because it's not going to come. It's going to come when the gospel has been preached around the globe. Yes. Two, define your destiny. I don't see my notes there. I don't know what, what happened. Defining, define your identity. What is it to define your identity? To define your identity means wherever you go, you are known. <laughs> you know, when Jesus Christ was going around the earth, he was known. Is this not the capital son? Or is this not Jesus of Nazareth? And we are praying about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. N define your identity. I love the question where Jesus Christ was asking in Matthew chapter 16. He's saying, who do you say I am? Defining your identity is whereby you enter every zone you are known to be that thing. And you do not change because of pressures, because of circumstances, you do not change. You stay the same. You identify your identity. You define your identity. Set goals. <laughs> Set goals. If it does not happen for 10 years, <laughs> Maybe my advice is <laughs> you can't sit on that goal for 10 years. Oh, it's there now. Thank you. You cannot sit there. So I've written some scriptures around that. Set goal. Proximity. Even when you prophesy, prophesy with, with the proximity that around this time, around this season, around there, there is nothing that has got no time. What time? When are we going to finish? What is a set goal? I remember when Nehemiah was given a task, there were proximities there. There was a time set there. About this time we shall accomplish this. This time we shall accomplish this. This time we shall accomplish this. And then on that areas of significance, the commitment. 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 In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, devote yourself in this thing. Commit yourself in this thing so that people might see progress. Commitment. There is another quote here. Embrace the synchro nitesis, for there are whispers from the universe guiding us towards the meaningful connections and extraordinary possibilities. We always say there are no coincidence. Why are you where you are? Who is surrounding you? Who is next to you? Can I, can I, can I make a practical example here? Did you, did you notice when they called the prophetic team, 
There is a prophetic team from Cindy. Cindy, raise your hand. She's, she's a prophet from, from Market, South Coast. And then Tanya, you are coming from Balito. Where's the, my other friend that comes from Richard's Bay? Richard's Bay. This area, Hillcrest Life Church. You see, for me, it speaks volume that now the prophetic is no longer going to be active in, on islands. Prophetic is going to be active when we gather together and speak one language and be united and speak a prophetic voice, not for our church to be recognized, not for us to be known, but for the Christ that is coming to be known. And then, what else? What time am I here? Jesus Christ, our example. Initial calling of a prophet. Can you, can you put up that, that scripture in, in Jeremiah chapter 1? I've written it down. Is there? But I can't see it. <laughs> There you go. Before I was formed, before I formed you in the womb, the initial calling of a prophet is not today. It's not because someone has called me and prophesied that I'm a prophet. Before you were born, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you and approved you. You know, you know, one of the things around the prophetic people is rejection. We always go around and seek for approval. But can you take the scripture and make it alive in your life? You don't need anyone's approval. You need God's approval. He is saying before even your mother knew that she was pregnant, God already knew that there is a, there is a prophet that is going to sit on that womb. I've been sharing recently about how I was conceived. The rejection, the rejection I faced throughout my life. But one day, there's something that God spoke, you know, clearly in me. That you know what, Moy? All I needed was a womb of a Zulu woman and the womb of a white man. So that Moy, M-O-O-I, will be born. So it was in them, they were a vessel, incubators of God's divine purpose upon this vessel. Some of us are stuck with rejection. Some of us are stuck being not recognized and approved. Can this word become alive in your life? You were approved before the creation of the universe. God knew that you would be his vessel. He said, before you were born, I concentrated you to myself as my own. And I have appointed you as a prophet to the nation. The purpose and of the prophets is verse 7, 8, and 10. Nations, this word, nations. Nations is from the Greek root word ethnos. It means any group of people that is af af affiliated in some way, whether geographically, culture, or tribe. Nations, not the tribe. And another thing I want to say to the prophetic people, be flexible. Be a prophet that is flexible. Do not be, be enslaved by religion and culture. Get out of religion and get out of culture. Just allow God to use his vessels in any manner that he wants to use them. Extend your borders. Sample of the prophet of nation. Make a tick and a wrong and a cross and a tick. So a prophet of nations, character traits of a prophet of a nation or prophet of nations is a leader who brought all races together. It's not my people, my Zulu people, my Africans people, my, we bring all people together and you are not discriminating and you are not choosing and pick and peck and peck. You are bringing God's people together, all races together. It, 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 it sometimes disappoints us when people, in, on, people on the road or on the street are talking about Christians. They are saying, we are the most bitter people ever on the earth. 
We are not friendly. Am I lying? Clear vision. Romans 1 verse 1, you can write alongside your notes. Defining your, your identities. I've spoken about that. Pivotal role in your country. What is a pivotal role in your country? Not in your church. In your country. Pivotal role that you are playing in your country. What is it? Influence extending beyond the pulpit. Most of the time we want to take the mic and give a prophetic word to the church. Prophetic people is not about the pulpit. It's out there beyond the pulpit, into the community, into the nation, into the nations. Interact with prominent figures. Have you ever tried to make an appointment with the chief? Bridge builder. Global imp impact. Serving internationally. The value that we're going to bring is a value that will impact the whole universe. Are there any minutes left for me to call the prophetic team? 20 minutes. Prophetic team, let's come back and shoot the penalty. <laughs> prophetic team, let's come. I, that gentleman that is wearing red, right at the back, right at, yes, yes. Can you wave your head? Yeah. The evangelist of this time. I don't know what is your name, please. Lunge, if there is a mic, you're, you're, you're. Can you, can, can, if possible, can you just walk up to the front, the one that is wearing a maroon, yeah. I see an evangelist. I see a leader. I see young people around your community impacted by your, 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 your influence. I have no doubt that God has called you for such a time as this to win the youth of your community. There is a leader in you. There is an evangelist in you. God is, 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 is pruning and is shaping your mouth. Now, not only your community, even beyond your community. I want to give you this, 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 this concept. The concept of a soccer match between this community and that community. And you'll see how God will use that for you to evangelize, for you to win the younger ones for the kingdom of God. Yeah. Are you familiar with that? In what way? Okay. So now, so now I'm throwing myself into the pit. If 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 I'm wrong, I will say uh, I apologize. But 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 I have no doubt that there is a leader, there is an evangelist, there is someone who is already impacting the youth in in your area. But God wants you to move into another area. Can you say something? Uh, I do school ministry. Uh, I lead a church. Yeah, and I, I just see, I see you uh, starting clubs, and I see them almost like a franchise, where you start something, and it, you're able to export that franchise to the next area to go and uh, use as a tool to reach those people that you're going to reach. And I see, uh, funny enough, I also saw. Uh, a soccer, soccer uh, clubs. Anyway, I felt like a club, so I just want to encourage you. Um, I sense that um, when you were a little boy or when you were growing up, people wanted to cut you down to size. It's as though people didn't see the potential in you. But today we see the potential in you that things are going to grow bigger and greater. But it's our mindset and our, it's our heart because God has called us to a place where we need to not think with what the world says. We're not to think what our peers say. <clears throat> and we're not to see or think what our family says. We need to hear what God says. Because it's our mandate that Moe just said now, it's our mandate of what God has given us in our heart, how we are to fulfill our mandate. It's not what, our, what we hear around us. 
It's not the noise we hear around us. And I think that speaks to all of us as well. We're not to hear the noise around us. We need to hear what God says in our hearts. Can I ask which area of South Africa you come from? Are you local KZN? Which part? Mlazi, Komashu? Lovo, down that side. Okay. Rural. The rural area or is it in the Lobo Township itself? I come from Mkomas. In Lobo Township. Okay. And you've got, you're a pastor of one church, you say. Okay. I see in you many more churches. It's not just one. When we look at a church, there's, we think there's got to be 150. Or two. To me, 10, 15 in different areas of where you are. And God will raise up people that are like-minded next to you so that you won't have to carry the burden alone. I've just got this feeling that you're not alone in this. But where you are, God is going to move you village to village to village to village to village to village. And that way you will grow the kingdom of God in Ilova. I also confirmed this soccer thing. Before Moy even said it, I just felt soccer coach, children running around. But what I felt now is that the Lord is going to increase your capacity. Because right now, it, it might be a small thing that you're doing. But God is saying, no, there is far greater that I want you to be doing. The churches, I see them as, as, as soccer fields, different schools, where you're going to go into schools and, and soccer coaching or whatever sport that you're going to coach, is actually going to be your church, where you're going to raise up new generations. You're going to start taking little ones. The little ones are going to grow up to be the bigger ones. Ricardo, we're going to see a nation full of Ricardos because of what you're doing. You've got Ephesians 2.8 on your shirt. I thought you were in Ephesians 4. With the gifts that Jesus is placing on you. Let's raise our hands to him. Father, bless this man. Bless him with an enlarged capacity to do the work that you've called him to do. Enlarge his heart for what you've called him to do, Father God. I pray for finances over him. I pray, Lord, that you would provide everything that he needs to fulfill the ministry that you're sending him into. He's not shying away from it, Father. Increase those tents. Increase those gyros. Put his pegs in deep, Father God. Bless him. Surround him with incredible assistance to help him with the youth of today because the youth need men like this, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, in your mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the man that I've been waiting to prophesy on is not here now. He was, stand, he was sitting at the back with a cap on. Is he around? Have they left? Ah, okay. The other person I had for was somebody. Do we have somebody here called either Gerald, Jerry, or Jeremy? Does anybody here with that kind of name? Close to Jeffrey or... Or even if you might know somebody with that name. Does anybody know that? Jeremy, a believer. Okay, so the Lord gave me this word for, for, for him. And I saw a picture of a, of a ship breaking ice. And I felt God saying that he's going to use him to break and take ground for the, for the kingdom. So we just trust in that for him as well. The lady in the black shirt here, with the short blonde hair. I, what's your name? Shelly. I, I, I got the sense that you were expectant of something for, from today. I, I'm really stepping out here because I'm trusting God is actually going to give me the word as I'm speaking. Um, but I felt for you that there's a journey that you've been on and that you've been waiting for an answer from God for something. I'm not sure if, if, if I'm on track with this. Not meaning anything. We're allowed to make mistakes. It's a safe place. And I'm really, I'm trusting that I'm hearing from God. But if, if I'm not, forgive me for that. But I just, what I did see was a road. 
And I felt that you were on this road. It was a good road. It was a straight road. But I felt that you were waiting for something from the Lord. And I felt the Lord saying, He will answer you in this, whatever it is that you're waiting on. I'm drawn by the colors. There are colors that are very, like, if you can quickly come, this, co this color, uh, that color and that color, you are wearing glasses, you are wearing glasses. I'm getting the word Deborah, shall you stand? You, shall you, and, the, and the gentleman before you, shall you stand? And then this color, that color there, shall you stand? And that color there, you are wearing glasses. Could you please just come? If the, if, if the prophet, prophetic people you hear, any word for... for for, for that. But the, the lady that you were wearing glasses, you are no longer wearing them. You have a Deborah anointing. And the enemy has been putting fences around you. You want to break through, but there is always a fence. But I want us to prophetically declare upon this woman, because you carry three anointing, an anointing of a mother, an anointing of a prophet, an anointing of a judge. But now, and again, and again, and again, there's been this fences where you're trying to push through and the fence will be just like saying you're not going anywhere and I prophetically declare Isaiah 22 verse 22 over your life I'm saying the keys of David is upon your shoulders you shall open doors that no man can shut you shall shut doors that can we stretch our hands upon this this lady The fences are being removed upon your life. The walls are being removed upon your life. You are going into the community and you are impacting the community exactly as Deborah was doing in her times. He said, until I, Deborah, arose, everything ceased until I, Deborah, arose. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ upon your life. I'm calling for those things that are not as though they are. You shall not be hindered anymore. There shall not be any fences around you anymore. You are being brought in. You are being brought in. You are being brought in. The road is open. The doors are open. Amen. The gentleman before you, anybody who's got a word for you. I see some preparation in your hands. Almost I did the uh, Kenneth Hagen walk on the, on the water. Um, do you prepare things? I see you preparing things. I see you preparing things and I see things that you are imparting in that what you are preparing. But I sense that there is some, some prayer that you are needing to place in these things that you are preparing. And as you prepare them, you'll see the effect of your prayers on the people that are, I don't know if they eat or, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what you are doing. I can't see that. I just see your preparation. But it's not the heart of what your hands prepare, but it's what the heart prepares. I see the heart of preparation of those prayers that you speak over them. But you are going to see the manifestation of the prayers that you've been praying and the, and the effort and the places and the people that's going to be so affected by the prayers that you're using because of the preparation of your heart. Not, the, not just the preparation of your hands. Does that speak to you? Amen, brother. That's, that's the, just want to be the same color. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to walk in the field. Yeah, I've, I really see you've been such a faithful man. And I'm telling you, in the midst of very, very hard times, you didn't give up being faithful. And I sit, I don't know if you're in business, what you do, but I see you sitting with finances and you don't waste money. I see you sitting with it and you calculate this goes for this, this goes for this, this goes for this, and you stand up and you walk and you walk by faith in many situations. And God has always been faithful and there's been like a faithful, like a rhythm but God is saying, your acceleration is here. Your business, Father, we speak increase over him. We speak promotion, favor over him right now. And I thank you, God, for a faithful man that he has stewarded well what you have entrusted unto him. And therefore, it's harvest time for you. I'm, 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 I'm drawn to the colors that were picked. They are all green. And I'm, I'm, I'm sensing newness to all of you. 
I'm reminded of the scripture that says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Wow. I so pray that you behold, that you see the new thing that God is doing. If you can just receive that, that's what the Lord is saying to me, to say, Behold, I am doing a new thing. And it's springing forth, and it is so green. It is so green. Behold. Can I just finish? Um, when we were praying, when we were praying for the youth, um, it was laid in my spirit. Actually, I when I, when we were closing eyes, I closed my eyes and I saw a like a, 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 a big yard, hectares of gum tree. You know, the tall, the tall, and they were tall and they looked very ripe for for them to be processed. Yes, um, but when I started praying, that bush started to bend. It was like it's not the gum tree that is ready or it's going to produce what it's supposed to be producing. Um, when the bush started to, to, to burn, it was laid in my spirit to tell it to God's people, to say it means the, the, the fire has started, the bush is burning. If we can believe in the prayer that we just did here, and there are people that God is going to continue to remind you of this prayer item. When you are one of those, please don't let the fire cool down. Keep it burning. Um, on the same gentleman with the turquoise jacket, um, I, I see a man of resources. You are like a, um, a well, a resourceful man. And uh, because you store things, you have a storehouse where you store it so that when there is a need, you are there to cover the need. You are a resourceful man to the family, to the work environment where you are. People depend on you for resources. And there's a lady with glasses with a green dress, folding arms, next to the orange lady. Yes, when I see you, I, I, I see you research or search. It's like you are a lady who's, who keeps on searching for things, especially in writing, whether you read books, but you search, you research. And I see like God is like saying, as you are busy searching for what you are searching, I'm getting closer to you, to meet you at the point of need, because you are busy searching, but actually you should be searching me. But he's not focusing on that, he's just following your search. Whatever you search, you will find God in everything that you're busy searching you will see God in everything until you meet God face to face. I saw a dove sitting on a, it's like a young gentleman right at the back against the wall. If, she, if he can stand, you are wearing black, right at the back, right there. And the scripture that is upon you is the scripture in Judges chapter 6, verse 12. You are sitting right at the bed, and I saw the dove coming above your head. And verse 12 of, that, of, of, of your word is saying, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But Gideon answered and replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of the Midianite. The Lord turned to him. The Lord is speaking to you, young gentlemen. And he's saying, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midianite hand. I am not sending you. I almost feel like God is calling you into the marketplace. God is calling you into the community. Everything that you have experienced in life, it was for this very purpose, where God is saying, go and deliver my people out of poverty. Go and deliver my people of wading through. There will be empowerment programs that you're going to bring. There's going to be skills development that you're going to bring. You're going to bring, you're going to bring food on, on family's table. God is entrusting you. And right here as I speak, you are representing even young men that is here. God is not calling you to the church, but God is calling you to the community to uplift those that are underprivileged. I've got to wait for Lindy. Well, 
Lindywe, this is what the Lord is saying. This is not your husband speaking. God is using your sickness to bring you to another level. There are things that God wants you to bring you on. There is a change that is coming in your life. And God is using this sickness to bring you high there. Don't look at the sickness that you are having as if it's something that's going to finish you. It's not going to finish you, but God is promoting you to the higher level. I just see God wants to release dreams and visions over you. I see an intimacy with the Lord like you've never experienced before. And I just see it's a new day that God is declaring over you. And his peace to come upon you. And I see new growth. And I see it's the stillness of what God wants to do. And the same for you. I actually experience also new growth. It's as if God has moved you from a place and placed you in a new era. area. And you, there's a season change in your life. And I see you receiving the correct nourishment for your purpose. And the new growth is about to start happening. Remember, growth happens under the ground. So don't be moved because you don't see it just yet. It is happening behind the ground. But I see a tremendous um, uh, spurt of growth that God is going to do in, in your life. I just felt, I actually, when I arrived this morning, you walked past me and I was, your beauty captured my eye. And I just felt you have an Esther anointing over you where the king is enthralled by your beauty and you have his attention and that he reaches out his scepter for you to touch and you can stand in the gap on behalf of a nation and you can see people come into freedom and fullness. And I believe that there's an area of breakthrough that you have that other people don't have because of the authority that you carry and the willingness to go and stand in the gap and meet with the king. Um, sorry, ma'am? Yes, you. Yes, the one with the hand up. Yeah. Uh, so what's your name? Sinead. Sinead, what was, um, God kept on highlighting you. And then suddenly what came to me was, you know when uh, someone goes to the swimming pool, so they, at first someone teaches them to dive into the pool, eventually they go to the diving board, and then eventually I, I got this thing for you, it's like God's taking you to a very high diving board. At times he's going to take you out of your comfort zone where you're going to go, Lord, I haven't experienced this before. But what I get for you is, you are actually going to be so obedient to him. And every single time you obey his voice, you're going to see him come through. And you're going to become so skillful in functioning in the gifts that he has for you. And you are going to encourage so many, you know, so many. You're going to encourage women who really need, what I'm getting is, he's the lift of their head. Your words are going to lift their head and gain new perspective. Amen. Amen. Sir, so what is your name? Clyde. Clyde. Uh, Clyde, God kept on highlighting you. Um, I don't know what is it you do, whatever the case may be, but there are going to be men that your words, it's literally going to be sometimes a slap across the face. I know that sounds, that's not encouraging, but your words are going to wake them up. Because there are some men, youngsters as well, they're not, they're not looking at life seriously, you know. Um, so the thing is, for you, your words are going to be words of purpose and destiny. But they actually, at times, you're going to think, I oh, know, Lord, how can I say this? But God's going to give you that assertiveness with such basting with love that they're going to actually take it. They're going to go, no, this guy must care. So you're going to wake up a lot of young men because otherwise I just get these young men would actually go into the wrong path, land up in prison, even possibly dead. You know? So you're going to do that with a lot of young men. Peace. And, uh, it's a fathering uh, gift that God's got on you. And you don't have to look at your age and think either I'm too old, too young, too whatever. But there is a, there is a nation of unfathered people out there that need people like you 
to bring them up in the ways of the Lord. So I wanted, it's such an amazing gift and such an amazing anointing uh, to change people's lives. Um, so I just want to encourage you. Sorry, you. What's your name? Sorry, Tyron. Uh, yeah, I just was as you were walking up. Sorry, I know we're supposed to be doing them, but you may as well get a blessing while you're about it. Hey. So while you were walking up, I noticed that you're obviously a man who enjoys um, doing gym, or kind of, you know, I don't know why, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> and I see a strength on you, um, a natural strength on you that um, is, is, is visible to others. But I want to say there's two things that I see on you. I see, an, uh, I see a spiritual strength on you. Um, where you have an ability to go into a situation and everyone's going in that direction and you're able to say, no, we are going in this direction. And I, and I see that leadership on you that has an ability to bring people through and bring people along the right path where before they were going in, in the different direction. But more than that, I see although on the outside you look like the strong man, Inside you, marshmallow. I really feel that there is such a softness in you. And it's an amazing gift to have the strength and the softness together. It's an amazing strength. And, and the thing is, what I, what I see is people being able to come alongside you. I don't know if you're a pastor, but I see something of that pastoral anointing on you. That, is enabled, that it, it enables people to, to, to feel safe with you, but to also feel loved. And as you operate in that gifting, <clears throat> you're going to see people raising up, being raised up, and they are going to go beyond where you've been. And, but you're the kind of guy that you're going to celebrate that. You're not going to be intimidated. You're not intimidated by other people's success because God, I just get such a sense, you know that you know that you know who you are in Christ. And because of that, that identity enables other people to rise up in the identity that God's given them. So I want to encourage you. Okay. And there's... Oh. You're going to do someone else? Because I want to do someone else. Is that all right? Someone else. Someone else. Is that all right? Can I someone do it? The lady here that's sitting next to Shiloh here. Um, I just saw... You know what, I, what, uh, 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 what got my attention were your your rings and your jewelry. And I felt like God was saying that you're a jewel in his crown. Um, but darling, I feel almost as though you have kind of slowed down a little bit. I feel like that you've kind of thought, well, look, I can now relax. Um, you know, I've done my bit, and now I'm, I'm able to cruise a little bit. But I feel like God is calling you into a new season where you are going to have to fire up those engines again in such a way because God is wanting to, to open some new doors into your uh, through your life and into, into the people around you. And he is calling you even to, um, I just feel like you need to write down some stuff. Um, I don't know if you do any kind of writing of any sorts, but I feel like it's almost like I've now got to write down what I've been involved in and how I've done it. I feel like there's almost like a, a training manuals things like that, that God wants you to start writing. And, um, and girl, get some more bling, man. It's never, it's never out of fashion. <laughs> so have fun. Because I really feel it's, it's a picture, we laugh, but actually it's a picture of what God has got of you, who he, how he sees you. And so I really feel that you need to recognize that you carry value in his kingdom. That lady that is wearing that color, yes, yeah. I want to read the scripture, and it might happen that might be a scripture, scripture for someone else as well. It's in the book of Songs, chapter 2, verses 11. I saw a vision of you. You are wearing a heavy coat. It's like it's raining, it's cold, it's winter, but it's not winter. And you are wearing it. In public, you are wearing it. And then for me, I felt like, is it not the Lord saying to you, take off that jacket, the winter is past. The rains are over and are gone. Flowers appear on the earth and the season of season singing has come. The queen of death is head in our land. I feel like you are wearing this coat, it's heavy, but already it's summer. 
And God is saying, let go of the past. Let go of everything and allow God to usher you into a, a new season. Take off that heavy coat. Take off that dark coat. Take off of everything that you have experienced now because God is ushering you into a new season of joy. You know Psalms 1, uh, uh, what, that scripture that says, it will be like you are dreaming. You will say, look at the wonders and the, and the, and the wonder working God. But God is saying, can you just let go? Take off, the, off that heavy jacket and allow the new season that God is ushering you. You've got an, a, 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 a governmental character trait where God is entrusting you. In the, in the, you know people that are in the managerial CEO, something like that? God is entrusting you, but is entrusting you for his purpose. You are called into the area and the space of where you are for such a time as this. You have been faithful and God is showing himself faithful to you. Let go on the how. Let allow God to unfold the how. This um, This is for you, Moy, actually. Um, I've been just meditating on a word God's been giving me while I was sitting here and you were teaching. So what I saw with, with what God's doing with your life and your ministry is um, God loves things that are really beautiful. And he showed me how he's using you to just enhance and make and beautify the things that God has placed in people. You're touching people's lives. And the Lord showed me like a place, like a storeroom where... There's forgotten paintings, there's forgotten um, vases, pots of silver and gold and precious rare items that are actually carry a lot of value. And how God sent you into that place and I saw him just using that brass or that polish and you just make things, just recreate and, and just beautify it in such a beautiful way that when they go out and then they are displayed that God's glory shine on them and they can carry again you guys can carry again the things that God has has, has beautified within you um, through this ministry so thank you Moy God bless you can I, I just wanted to share this is that okay just share a word for anyone. <laughs> the, the, just anyone who owns a cell phone this, or a mobile device, this word is for you. Okay, without being um, conflicting with the other words that came earlier on. Jeremiah 1 verse 9. Then the Lord reached over his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See today, and I can read this, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to bruise and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. And again, I don't want to be contrary to the words that came earlier about social media. Of course, doom scrolling is not helpful. But I really believe that we're in a generation and an age where we can use social media as a tool for a task. And God wants to give us divine strategies where we can prophesy on our Facebook pages. We know Facebook, we're in a selfie generation, selfish generation. People are consumed with themselves. So we can either use it as Facebook or fake book where you put out stuff that's not actually the truth of what's actually happening in your life. Or we can use it as faith book to accelerate things in people's lives and just drop seeds and water seeds that people already have in their lives. Just for you, Moi. Um, Volma says she saw you as a black card. Puzzle. And you didn't know what the meaning of the puzzle is. Now, puzzle is different pieces string together. Now, I saw... The word God gave it to me, he says, where there is division in, in communities, God's going to bring you to promote unity in communities, especially between white people and black people. You're going to be a voice. People are going to look at you and they're going to say to you, yeah, but look at this African woman standing in front of me. But you are going to bring reconciliation. You're going to bring healing. But most of all, you're going to bring truth into people's life. Amen. To uh, Zuki. When I looked at you, I saw a concrete pillar inside of you. 
And the scripture that came into me is Ezekiel 36, verse 26, where God is trading a, a heart of stone. Can I read it to you? And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Amen. To my brother, pastor of uh, Maroon Trexuit. Can you, my brother, the one who was here. I'm sorry they released you earlier. While we were here, the Lord showed me that you want to grow your ministry. But you were having the problem of saying, how? And the Lord is saying, we have to lay your plans down. You write your plan down and bring it to God. And God will lead you. Amen. There is a race that I must run. There are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to... If the worship team can join me just for a second. There is a race that I must run. There are victories to give me power every hour. There is a must run. There are victories to be won. Can you start prophesying and declaring it, right? You're talking about the world creating. So there is a race. There is a race. There is a race in each and every one that is represented here. There is a race.
it is such a privilege for me to welcome Pastor William Beckson to come. Forward and share with us, if you can, with great anticipation and faith and love, welcome with a big round of applause. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. I thank the Lord for the opportunity to share um, his thoughts with us uh, today. I feel very strongly the oneness of the spirit and um, I'm trusting that I will also complement uh, what it is that the Lord is pushing forth quite forcefully uh, in today's prophetic equip. Amen. All right, so um, if the AV team can help me, um, we're looking at borderless thinking. Borderless thinking. Borderless thinking. Um, clearly, that's the, the sense. That's the essence of what God is seeking to push uh, through our spirits. Expanding your borders is not creating a new border. We're not saying expand your body so it used to be here now I'm putting it here. No. Your head sits in the heavens. Is Jesus. We are his body. Our head is sitting in the heavens. So borderless thinking. Amen. Um, the next page please. I believe very strongly that this is a divine imperative. God is not suggesting to us to expand. It's a divine command because he wants to do something so significant in the earth. Uh, the, the, the thinking infrastructure that will be required uh, to host what God wants to produce in the earth um, will demand borderlessness in our thinking. And uh, we all know the text we are looking at, Isaiah 54. It's been read before, and so permit me to skip that and, and go to the next slide. Uh, there is an interesting text I want us to consider. I, uh, Psalms chapter 78, uh, verse 41 and 42. Next slide, please. Psalms chapter 78, verse 41 and 42. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Uh, verse 2, 42 gives us an inclination as to what constituted the limitation. He said, they remembered not his hand, and nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. They remembered not. That means they were not mindful of his hand. And so what constitutes limitation is in your head. And God, by his spirit, wants to help us so powerfully today uh, to become borderless in our thinking. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, uh, the scripture declares that the natural man, unregenerated man, uh, cannot receive the things of the spirit of God. The natural man cannot why? Because they are spiritually deserved. So he has no clue. There is no connectivity. But in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, the Bible says the carnal mind is an opposition to God. The carnal mind 
is enmity with God. It cannot also receive the things of God because it is not subject to it, neither can it be. And this is so powerful because the natural man who is the unbeliever cannot receive the things of God. But it so happens that the believer who is also carnally minded is also an opposition to God. Now this is a very interesting case. Because by the time we read Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says the heir, as long as he is a child, he is not different from a slave, even though he is Lord of all. The heir, as long as he is a child, is not different from a slave, even though he is Lord of all. So if the heir is a child in his thinking, a child in his understanding, a child in his perspective, his appreciation, a child in his orientation, God says he's not different from a slave. Just like the natural man cannot receive, the carnal mind is also an opposition. So we leave God with no option. If we continue to think narrow and small. This is so powerful because many times we just pride ourselves that we are believers. But the way you are thinking can constitute an opposition to the move of God on the earth. And so if that is it, then in terms of your usefulness index in the kingdom, there is pretty much no difference between you and an unbeliever. The unbeliever cannot receive, but you are an opposition to God. So whether it's you or an unbeliever, we are constituting a limitation to what God can do through us. And the good news is that we are the body he has in the earth. If he can do it through us, We are his first choice. We are God's priority. He wants to use his body for his work on the earth. But the way we think can limit him. And so in the next slide, I consider the kingdom perspective, which is such a liberator. The kingdom perspective, uh, the right frames for life. You know, the Bible says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the word of God is, is the right frame for life. Many of us can see life through different prisms. But the best way to view life is to view it from the kingdom perspective. And it's interesting how Jesus in John chapter 5 uh, verse 17, he says, My father worketh, hitherto I work. So I don't care what is happening around me. I'm plugged into something. I'm plugged into someone. And as I see him, that's how I move here. So I can be limited by what culture is saying because I'm seeing beyond culture and I'm implementing whatever it is I'm seeing my father do. Uh, In verse 19, he says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater things or greater works than these, that ye may marvel. So, as a prophetic people, we are supposed to be seeing what the Father is doing, and releasing that over our communities. We're supposed to be seeing what the Father is doing and declaring that over our cities. We're supposed to be seeing what the Father is doing and releasing it over people, over families, over churches, over homes. When we do that, we are redefining possibility. When we do that, we are prophesying new civilizations (coughs) upon the horizon. We can't be complaining about what is happening around us when the Father is busy working 
And our job as a prophetic people is to see what the Father is doing and declare that over the society. So we are not limited by the social construct. There is something we are seeing beyond the obvious. There is something we are seeing beyond the visible. And as we see, we declare that over our society. And so it's critical that we have a kingdom perspective because that's the only frame that is consistent with the emphasis of God from eternity past, eternity now, and eternity future. God's kingdom is God's motif. That's the only perspective that gives us an accurate vision of what God wants to establish on the earth. So, in this regard, as we see the Father do, and we also do say, we will realize that we are becoming aware of something beyond the natural. The Father is moving in the supernatural. We have access to see that, and we replicate same on the earth. Yeah, it's right. Good. There is a very powerful text in Joshua chapter one, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And I want to read that quickly to us. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Um, just helping us see how God does these things. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. I read from the King James uh, Version. Joshua chapter 6, 1 and 2. Here we go. Now Jericho was strictly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Well guarded. Strictly shut up. Nobody can come in, nobody can go out. But look at verse 2 of Joshua chapter 6. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See. I have given into thine hand Jericho Amen. and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. See. Uh, the question that is asked in the school of prophets is what seest thou? What seest thou? Because that's what defines everything. See, I have given Jericho but if we see, they are protected. Like, by what we are seeing, there is no way we can take this city. They are well guarded, well protected, but God says, see, I have given Jericho into thine hand. You know, some of us want to see it in our hand before we see it. Yeah. But God says, see it that I have put it in your hand. Even though your hand may look empty, see beyond the emptiness and see what I have put in your head. Now, this text is so powerful. God was telling Joshua, what you are going to see is going to determine what you can seize. You can't seize this city if you don't see it in your hand. Even though they are hemmed in, they are, they are protected, they are guarded. And so there has to be a borderlessness in the way we think to be able to possess cities for God. There has to be a borderlessness in the way we think. And it's interesting when God committed this to Joshua, Joshua now spoke to the children of Israel and said, you know what? We're going to go around the city seven times. Now in those seven times, nobody should utter a word. Don't say anything. No make any noise. And then on the seventh time, we are going to, on the sixth time, sorry, we are going to do it seven times. You know what they were doing? They were seeing. Many of us are in a hurry to act. Yeah. You've got to see it before you action it. The reason why our activities have been fruitless is because we've not seen it register yet, but we are busy. So for six days, they were going around the city seeing that Jericho had been given to them. 
That means if you don't change your awareness, you can't take the city. If we still think we are vulnerable and victims and, you know, just part of the masses, there is no way we're going to make a difference in the city. See, I have given Jericho to you. You see it before you take action. If you've not seen it, you can't take action. And this is, this is strong. So we need to see what God is saying to be able to see what God is seeing. And when we see what God is seeing, we will now say what God says. You see, so by the time a prophet is prophesying, he has seen what God is seeing. That's what makes us prophetic. I see something beyond the obvious. And I start declaring it before it becomes obvious to everyone else. (coughs) So, one of the mighty things God does with the prophetic is to help expand people's thinking. The prophetic expands the thinking of the people because the real limitation is not physical, it's mental. The real limitation is not physical, mm-hmm. it's mental. Mm-hmm. That's where the strongholds are. So the prophetic helps expand us. The prophetic helps prioritize kingdom advancement. Amen. That's what this whole thing is about. You know, I come from a nation where the prophetic is so rife. You know, it's like we use prophetic for entertainment. I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, like, they can prophesy, they, they, they can prophesy the rights you ate yesterday and count the grains for you. You know, like something like that. You know, for entertainment, just to help you see how deep I am. But that's not the essence of the prophetic. The prophetic is an equip. Because God wants to expand his people. Because God wants us to possess the land. And so in John chapter 4, a very powerful text where um, Jesus puts the prophetic on display and stewards it so powerfully that we see the end goal of the prophetic. The Bible said Jesus, um, coming through Samaria, comes to a well, Jacob's well, and Jesus was wearied from his journey. He was tired. And his, his disciples said, you know what? Wait, we have some energy. Let's go into the city, get some food, and then bring it to you here. So Jesus is tired. Ministry is not what's on his mind. He's tired. He's just resting, waiting for food to refuel and re-energize. And then here comes a woman at the sitter, 12 o'clock, sunny, hot. And Jesus sees a ministry opportunity and forgets his tiredness, his weariness. And says, woman, can you give me some water to drink? Says, wait a minute, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, we have no dealings. Your request is rejected. Then Jesus says, if you knew him, who it was who is asking you of this, and if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The one says, you don't have anything to draw this water. How are you going to fetch it? Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who drank from this? Jesus says, anybody who drinks this water will thirst again. But the water that I will give that person shall become in him a well springing forth unto eternal life. As weird as this sounded, the woman said, give me this water so that I won't come here again. You know, it's still still selfish, it's still physical, it's still about air. Oh, you have something that won't make me come here again? Give it to me, I want it. Jesus says, okay, okay, I hear you. I'll give it to you, but one more thing. Go and call me your husband. 
Um, Jesus, you've asked the hard thing. I, I don't have a husband, you see. Then he says, you're right. You've had five. Even the current is still not your husband. Now, the, the woman is engaging the prophetic. <coughs> because she said, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. So, so the prophetic is engaging her strategically. And then the Bible said the woman left her water pot. The prophetic soul turned her around. She became others minded. She shifted from selfishness, self-centeredness, self-seeking, self-preservation, left her water pot and ran to the city. The reason why she came was no more important. The prophetic helps the church reprioritize the kingdom. The prophetic must help us reprioritize that it's not just about us. So she left her water pot. I went to the city. I said, come and see. I've met a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this not be the Christ? Like, I didn't come with an answer. I came with a question. Could this be the Christ? The Bible says the man came out. And when they came and met Jesus and interacted with Jesus, they said, we are not even believing him because of what you told us. What we have heard ourselves, this is the Messiah. Jesus touched a citizen who touched her city. This whole thing is not about you. It's about Deba. It's about Jobek. It's about Cape Town. It's about South Africa. It's about Southern Africa. It's about Africa. It's about the world. It's about the kingdom. So when Jesus sees you, he's seeing a city connected to you. He's empowering you. It's not just to put bread on the table. This woman went into a city and turned the whole city upside down. Because of her encounter with the prophet Jesus. When people encounter you, do you increase their selfishness index? No, when pe- you are the mighty prophet, we agree. <laughs> prophet of God, we honor you. But when people encounter you, do you make them more self centered or kingdom centered? Do you make them more selfish or kingdom centric? That's the essence of the prophetic. The kingdom of God and its advancement on the earth. So, I want to read you a text. I'll land on that. I'll land on that. I know um, we are far pressed for time, but God is helping us. Amen. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 11. Ezekiel chapter 11. I'm, I'm going to read it um, in the message translation and um, maybe support it with King James. Uh, but Ezekiel chapter 11 gives us a powerful narrative that helps capture what God wants to accomplish with us. Ezekiel chapter 11. Um, Let let me read. Let me read. um, Okay. Let me read from verse 1 quickly. Then the spirit picked me up and took me to the gate of the temple that faces east. There were 25 men standing at the gate. I recognized their leaders. Jazaniah son of Azer, and Pelatia, son of Beniah. God said, son of man, mighty prophet, these are the men who draw up blueprints for sin, who think up new programs for evil in this city. 
They say, we can make anything happen here. We are the best. We are the choice pieces of meat in the soup pot. Son of man, these are the men who draw a blueprint for sin. Who think up new programs for evil in this city. I feel that this is a prophetic word for us. The kingdom of darkness, according to this text, let's just localize it. 25 men who were responsible for the prosperity of evil in the city. Just 25. We are more than them. All of us here. We are more than these 25 men. But they said, you know what? We come up with a blueprint for evil, for sin. And we draw up new programs for evil in this city. You may not see them, but they are responsible for whatever is happening in the city. Through policies, through laws, through different enactments. But they are just 25. But, but, but the fabric of the society... The fabric of the city is, is woven by these 25 people. And look at us. Thousands and thousands of people with no consequence on the city. Thousands. Just 25 people. They say, we, we, we come up with blueprints for sin in the city. We are the guys who drop new programs for evil in the city. And it's happening. We can make anything happen. That means we are competent at what we do. We deliver. Just 25 men. And then, look at the body of Christ in Deva. We are bursting at the seams. In fact, we are here even saying, we want to expand more. We want to extend our borders. Because we are bursting at the seams. We need more people. What have we done with the ones we already have? Now, this was the dilemma God put Joshua in. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's, it's rather Gideon in Judges. The guy came up with an army of 32,000 men strong. <laughs> Going to fight the Amalekites and the Midianites. And God said, there are too many for me to give you the victory. There are too many. That means when God less is more. There are too many. I'll give you a strategy to whittle them down a bit. Just make an announcement. Anybody who is afraid, go back home. 22,000 people went back home. Do you know we call that church growth today? Church growth of 22,000 fearful people. Who God cannot use in the city. God cannot use in the city because they are afraid. God said, let them go back home. But these are guys wearing army uniforms. We are the soldiers of the city. We're going to take the land for the Lord. An announcement came and the army was pruned to 10,000. God said, there are still too many. Uh, let me give you another strategy. Um, take them to the riverside. Let's see how they drink. 9,700 people drank in a way that God said they are disqualified. This is what we can't use them. Let them go back home. An army of 32,000 was brought down to 300. And in chapter 7 of Judges, the Bible says they were going to fight these Midianites and Amalekites. And the Bible said they had spread themselves in the valley. They were as thick as locusts. The, the size of the opposition. As thick as locusts. And it says, as for their camels, they could not be counted like the sun at the seashore. Spread out. And God's people are 300 people. What chance do we have? But you see, we have called something church growth that God is not endorsing. So what we are prophesying in this conference, let there be more of the 300. 
not more of the 22,000 something. You see, what they can't help us in this matter. They will constitute an opposition to what God is doing in the end times. We need more of the 300. And less of the what? No, because 22,000 went first and then 9,700 went. So 22,000 plus 97 is what? 31,700. Can you imagine? 31,700 soldiers were not fit for kingdom work. Only 300. So if you have a church of 300 people and you think, what can we do? We are so small. What can we do? You probably are the one who can bring salvation to the rest of us. So if I'm sitting on 39,700 who are doing nothing, you, you hold the key to our salvation. But you are busy discounting yourself. Busy looking down on yourself because what can we do with 300 people? This whole city of there, but 300 people, what can we do? You probably hold the key. Because I may be sitting on my 39,700 and we are doing nothing in the city. We just congregate to have fun and go back home. And there is a city to be taken for God. There is a kingdom to be advanced. There is a kingdom to express. A Lord to represent. We're busy having fun. So the Lord said to Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy against these people. You see these guys who are coming up with blueprints for sin? These guys who are coming up with new programs, thinking up new programs for evil? Prophesy against them. Some things must fall in this city for the city to be free. Some structures must come down. Some ideas must be buried. And look at who the responsibility lied on. Ezekiel. What you are going to say will redefine the possibility of the city. What you are going to prophesy will reinstate the government of God on the land. So he said, prophesy, son of man. Prophesy against the systems. Prophesy against all the infrastructure. Prophesy against the things that need to come down. And he said, when I began to prophesy, one of the leaders fell down and died. Then Ezekiel himself started crying, oh my God, what's happening here? He said, whilst I was prophesying, the guy fell down and died. There is power in the prophetic word. And I came to encourage your heart all the way from West Africa that God wants to do something in this city and he wants to do it with you. The Lord bless you. Amen. Oh, what a word. Uh, Tanya, can you please come pray for us before we move on to the next session, just in response to this word. Excited. <laughs> Look at the person next to you. Say so you have a part to play. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you, Lord, that you don't look at the outward appearance of who we are, what we represent. Thank you, Lord, that you don't say, but you haven't got your university degree or you haven't got enough money in the bank. You don't look at the color of our skin. You look at our hearts. And Lord, we want to thank you, Father, that just as we have heard today, that Lord, as the prophetic is there to prepare the way for what God you're wanting to do, that Lord, we get what you're saying we, we get what you're seeing. We look and we see it for ourselves. And then we speak what you're speaking. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that those borders that were there, those natural borders, those spiritual borders, come down in the name of Jesus and show us that huge plane. It shows us to the ends of the earth that, Father, that we are not limited just to one a town or country or, or, or continent, but Father, we have you have given us a mandate that goes right throughout the world. 
And Lord, we want to pray right now, Father, that you will use us as that mighty army. Yes, maybe only 300, but Father, 300 people fully sold out to you. And Lord, we say, here we are. Won't you use us? Won't you use us in our area of influence to see what you're seeing and to speak what you're speaking? And we pray a blessing right now on William. We pray, Lord, your anointing to grow upon him. Father, that as he speaks, Lord, it won't just be good words because he's done a good study, but Father, it'll be God words. That, Lord, that even as he said right now, I'm going to stop now. As he stopped, we could feel, God, your presence upon the situation. And, Lord, I praise you and thank you, Father, that right now that you will take him beyond. That, Father, you extend even his area of influence. Yes, he's come down from Ghana. Yes, he's, 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 he's here in this area. But, Father, we say, Lord, even more beyond. Father, that he will not have to bow to anyone, but, Father, he will stand. And I see you even standing before uh, presidents and prime ministers and leaders in areas, and I see you standing, and having done all else, you carry on standing. And I see you with a forehead of flint. As you stand, I feel like you're going to be standing against some stuff, and as you stand against that stuff, the walls of Jericho will fall down, and people will be set free because of what you're standing for. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that even in his, in his mouth, Father, you put the right words, that as he speaks, it'll be like a, a hammer that'll break open situations as a fire that'll that will start a, 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 a felt fire that'll go throughout the lands. Not one land, fire does not know any borders. Fire goes until there's nothing more to burn. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that as he speaks, that'll be something of that fire that'll go out. And it'll go beyond and it'll go into the nations and across the borders until, Father, you get your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can I just speak a minute, please? <laughs> William, uh, uh, Apostle, uh, uh, because you carry that apostolic anointing, this is the scripture I'm getting. It's Ezra chapter 7, verse 6. This Ezra, so put your name on that scripture, came up from Babylon. And he was a teacher, well versed in law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given him. The God had granted him, sorry, the king had granted him everything he asked for the hand of the Lord, his God was on him. I want to give you that scripture. This is a season and the era. I feel like repeating this thing. The, the vision I saw when you were at the age of 24 to the age of 30, you used to do prophetic declarations. And this prophetic declaration, I see the word uh, in your hand says influence, influence, impact, influence. And I feel like this is the time and the era for the Lord to fulfill those prophetic declarations. You were young at that stage. You were not even in ministry at that stage. The way I look at it, you look like a student because I see books. It's like you are in a room full of books you are studying, but you are making this declaration. And the Lord is saying to me, Psalms 102, 13, the appointed time for the prophetic declarations that you made at, those, at that age is now time for it to be fulfilled. And you can test the Lord and see if the Lord is true by approaching the government of Ghana. I feel like in Ghana, Accra, Ghana, Central Ghana, already the impact and the influence is already seen. And I want you to take a step higher than that because the Bible says Ezra was well versed. I feel like God has graced you with an anointing, a unique distinctive teaching anointing for this now era. So now the king in Accra, beginning from Accra, and it's going to move into various nations of the continent and beyond the continent will grant you everything that you have asked for. You know why? Because you carry the DNA of asking. The Bible says, if anyone shall say, if anyone shall ask, I will give it to it. The king granted him everything because the hand of the Lord, his God, was upon him. 
take this thing. God is changing your shoes. It's no longer be a shoe for Accra. It's going to be a shoe for Cote d'Ivoire. It's going to be a shoe for Australia. It's going to be a shoe for Denmark. God is changing the shoes because you carry his weight with reverence. Hallelujah. Let's give God a big hand of praise one more time. And what a word, what a time for... Oh, hallelujah. One day coming back from work in a very exhaustive environment, I was at that time part of the executive team which was going through a turmoil at work. And it was a day I needed to come to the life group, cell group or small group during the week. I was so tired, exhausted, I didn't want to go. But I dragged myself there. While there, and that day, the life group had decided it was a prophetic day. It was going to be a prophetic, uh, a prophesying over as part of the. I did not want to participate. I sat at the back and I wanted just to be there because the Lord says, do not neglect the gathering of the saints as it is the, of the others. And I was there, present, but really I did not want to be there. I don't know, maybe it's only me, it never happens with you. <laughs> as I was there, the lady who was part of the life group wanted to say, can I pray for you? There were two of them. At that time, honestly, Inside, I was saying, maybe you can pass by. <laughs> Not today. But I said, oh, yeah, yeah, go for it. And on that day, what God used her to speak into my life, even in my moment when I did not want to hear it, and she did not know what it meant and what I was about. And it was confirmation of what God was saying and propelling me to. So just an encouragement to the prophets as they are gathering here, that sometimes the audience will not receive you, but it may not mean that the word that you speak is not the word that the very audience need, and the word that that very audience will be accelerated and transformed. And as they get transformed, not only them, but many others, they will be touched by that word. And that lady was the lady who was not even assuming when you will look at her and participate in the church. But yet the word that carried transformed me even in the moment when I honestly did not want to receive. So as I heard earlier talk about the faith and just doing as obediently as you are asked, as an encouragement, even though it may not look like the platform is suitable, or the audience is receiving, yours may just be to be obedient in faith and move on. Amen. Amen. Today, just to give a little bit of a roadmap on what we're about to on, 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 on the rest of the day, we're going to receive the word, um, and then after that, we're going to have breakout prophetic sessions, uh, and then after that, it will be almost close to the end of the day. So, so that you just have a picture of how the next is going to. So please allow me to welcome uh, Jack and Human, who is going to uh, share a word again this morning. If you can please um, welcome him. One more hand, please welcome him. I wonder if everybody can stand and just stretch. I know when you sit for a long time, you lose your focus. And, and then I quickly want to do two things before I start. Blood right. You can sit down. Thank you. So while I was, we were singing and I was praying and I walked to the back and I saw Marincha's picture that she's busy painting. I saw fruit basket and flowers. And the Holy Spirit really impressed upon my heart 
to tell you for the prophets, I'm giving you fruit to eat and flowers to give. Sure. So those that sit at his feet, you'll have fruit to eat and flowers to give. Please, yes. I don't know you. A Kenyoni. And I heard the three words that were the words that you gave. But Holy Spirit started speaking to me and I walked to the back there. Up and down, up and down, up and down. And then I said, Lord, are you sure? I need scripture. I don't like to prophesy, my guys know, I don't like to prophesy much in the church. Because I'm very careful with what I say. Because I've made a mistake in my life and it cost, I don't know afterwards, but cost somebody dearly because I prophesied wrongly. It was the right prophecy, I just delivered it wrongly. So I'm very careful. So I'm going to read to you what I've got and then I'll show you what the Lord said to me. I see the Lord pointing his anointing over you. He's going to raise you up to a supernatural level of prophecy. And you will be like a samurai. I literally saw a samurai with a sword when they slice through that bamboo or that, that they do. And the prophetic words that you do will sever that thing into two. And those things are the things within the church that's not of God. And you will establish through that his kingdom by bringing correction. And then the next thing, God is going to give you the gift of knowledge. That when you see a man or a woman, you will know their name. And you will know details of them and you will speak it. And that will impact their destiny and their purpose. I see God moving you. Don't know where, don't know how, but I see God moving you. And I see people will queue up for you to come and speak at their churches. But the Lord is telling you, don't go unless he sends you. And then I saw that it's going to be bittersweet. The sweetness of the Lord. Because of how he uses you. But I see you crying many tears because of the pain, the rejection, and even the resistance. And what I've told you, you'll find at his feet. So let him guide you. Let him lead you. And I'm going to wait expectant to see what he's going to do. Amen. I want to end with this, the scripture. Because this was my big confirmation. Then I said, Lord, now, my church guys know me. I can't always remember. They think I can because I read it before the time and I make notes. But I can't always remember where what is. I know scripture. I've read through the Bible many times. But, and I, I love New Testament. I don't read so much Old Testament. And then I said, Lord... Give me scripture. And just like that, he dropped in my heart, Ezekiel 37 verse 14, which says, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So I wrestled a lot. Sorry, this is mine. Prophetic book. I believe in this fine. I wrestled a lot with what I... They asked me for my slides and I couldn't. Because I was wrestling with the Lord. To the other day while I'm driving with my wife. I'm animated while I'm driving my mind. 
My wife just says, we cut it off, we brush it off. And I said, babe, I'm battling with the Lord about the word that he's given me. So I'm going to be faithful and give what he's given me. Can I have my fourth slide about stretching your tent? When Moy told me about stretching your tent pegs, I immediately got worried. I said, Lord, I don't like that scripture because the prosperity guy is about God's going to give you houses and cars and he's going to stretch you and he's going to increase your wealth. And, and I wrestled with that and I said, Lord, what are you trying to say? And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Uh, slide. Okay, come on, do my first one. And the Lord said, He's giving us a picture of what He wants to do. He wants to build and extend His kingdom through the church. God's, has, God's heart has always been one of expansion. Even the calling of mankind in Genesis 1 verse 28 that says, Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves of the earth. Um, commission from God has not changed. It has shifted from a natural place to a church. As his body we are to subdue the earth. There is no doubt about that. And I believe that when God says, enlarge your ten pegs, He is talking about the church that He wants to pour out His Spirit and bring people to salvation. So when you look at the context of the Scripture, you see Jerusalem, all the, all the, all the rich, all the wealthy, all the educated, all the men of renown have been stripped and taken away into exile. And what was left? A broke city, undefended, and people in poverty, battling. Raiders would come and raid. And they cried out and say, God, where are you? What is the story? And here the prophet comes, Isaiah comes, and he makes a prophetic declaration. Enlarge your ten pegs. Because he's talking about the increase of the people. He's talking about increase that God's going to bless and sons and daughters shall be added and they will become a mighty nation. You can read the whole portion. I'm not going to go into that. So when I saw this, I was saying, God, what are you telling us as a church? That you want to pour out your spirit. You want us to have dominion. You want us to build your kingdom. You want Durban and the whole world to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then I said, God, how does the prophetic fit within the context of what you want to do? And this was the wrestling part. So when I stopped by Oxford's, and so I'm just down the road, my wife said, oh, let's go. I said, no, please, you, you go shopping. I'll wait in the car. Because I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And I'm saying, Lord, what, how? And God gave me a scripture in Isaiah 43, verse 12. I'll read you the scripture. It says, I, even I, the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior, that's verse 11, I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord. This forms the perfect picture of what the prophetic is, and I'm going to break this down for you. Because this scripture embodies everything that symbolizes the prophetic. This talks about God who speaks. And then when we understand the prophetic, and, and this is where I want to, to put the gravity of the prophetic. God is the one who speaks through the prophets. And through the prophetic. Not me, not you. Unlike any other ministry, the prophetic does not have its own voice or personality. It does not have its own voice. Does not have its own personality. Why? Because it has to embody everything that constitutes God. It cannot be defiled by my flavor. 
It cannot be defiled by the way I am. There needs to be purity in the message that I give. And that when people see me, they don't see me, they see God. But you see, with it comes authority. When people see me, they can disrespect it. But when there's clarity that there's no distinction or no question that this is God, yes. people will know immediately, I defy that, I defy God. And this is where Tanya spoke about it become a bit flaky. You know why it's become flaky? Because we have introduced ourselves into the mixture of the prophetic. <coughs> our own agendas, our own things. And God's saying, I need the prophetic to be my voice. So firstly, he says, I have declared and saved. Declare is nachat. To tell, make known, or, or, or declare. So what does this mean? God's declaration, he says, I have declared and saved. That when God declares, he saves. He brings salvation to people. The declaration we know is found in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3. Sorry, I am rushing. Because I am fighting against time. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation and comfort to men. As prophets declare God's heart, identity, purposes and plans over people, both the saved and the unsaved become saved. And when we talk about salvation, we're not just talking about being born again. We're talking about healing, deliverance, destiny, direction, clarity. When I come to a man and I say, Thus saith the Lord to you, that you have been made in his image, his place is anointing for business or whatever, he wants you to go and do. We, sp we pray for the children with the school. We are the prophets to raise up people in government that will fight this. I'm asking the question. Where's our voice to start calling on me? Because I am very sure God wants to raise men and women in, the, in, in our education system that will stand for him and speak to protect our children. So my question is, where are the prophets that are calling those men and women out to speak against that? Where are they? You see, when, when we declare God's dreams, God's plans, God's purposes over people, healing takes place, salvation takes place, deliverance takes place, destiny is imparted and people start walking in the way in which they have to. No flaky nonsense. Just this is what the Lord says, now go and do. Always to build His kingdom. Always. There is no other thing. When it's anything else, guess what? It's about my building my kingdom. I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God amongst you. When I read this, I said, whoa. Second voice of the prophet, I have proclaimed. The first is I declare. The second one is proclamation. Now there's no foreign God. Now when you go look at this, at this Hebrew word, a shama. A lot of people know shama from this church. It means to tell, to cause someone to hear. It's when I make a proclamation that people may hear. It's when I expose stuff. So what is the context? No foreign God. The prophet will say, there are foreign gods. You are sacrificing on the mountains. You are doing this. You are doing that. There's a proclamation that goes out. That's the voice of God speaking about sin and stuff that's happening in churches and in society. Which then causes people to hear, they repent, and they leave it. Where are the prophets to proclaim the ways and the things of God? The result is purification, a cleaning out. Everything that stands against God. The result is that people become, what happens after that? Then you have become my witnesses. 
See, when we declare, when we, when we declare things over people, they are healed. When we proclaim things, sin is dealt with. And when that happens, purity comes to the house and the children of God then start to become witnesses for God. Simple recipe, one verse. So, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign gods amongst you. The prophetic forms an integral part in the work that God wants to do in the earth. When the prophetic imparts destiny and corrects the people, then they become witnesses for God. And the same is echoed in Ephesians 4 verse 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, the various fivefold ministries. The prophet has got its role in building up the church and then bring healing to the body. I'm rushing. So I just want to stop here quickly. In bringing purification to his house. Both the individual, also to the church, there needs to be a cleansing and a refocus. I said the next one is we need the heart of John the Baptist to return to the prophetic. It's not just John the Baptist, but it's Elijah. So many. He was called apart. He was a Nazarite. Nazarite means to be holy to God, to be separated unto God. It means he's taken away. He does not get involved in the normal dealings of what people want to do. They separated. Separated unto God. And I'm going to tell you straight. The strength of your prophetic word will always be dependent on how much you separated. I'm not talking about now let's form a cloister somewhere and we all go live there and then we come out. It's not what I'm talking about. We spoke about social media. We spoke about if you separate yourself unto God and you commit yourself just unto Him, you become separated. When you put off the TV, when you decide, I'm going to search for Him early in the morning, I'm going to seek through for Him late at night, I'm going to pray through the... I am seeking God because I want to be His voice. We need the prophetic to be called apart, consecrated to God. Now it's interesting, his main message was in Matthew 3, verse 1 to 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea by saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Was never for himself, was always for the kingdom. He came to present Jesus Christ, to promote Jesus Christ. And that's why um, in John 3, 30, he says, he must increase, I must decrease. It's all about Jesus Christ exalting Him. And it's all about the kingdom mindset. We've heard about that. I'm not going to go into much of that. The kingdom mindset is ingrained in our natural and spiritual DNA. Let me just stop here. Kingdom building is part of our makeup, natural and spiritual. In the natural, we form the kingdom of England. In the natural, we form a company. In the natural, everybody wants a business. Everybody wants a kingdom for themselves. In the natural. In this, because God made us like this. But you see, the calling on mankind is to build the kingdom of God, not our own kingdoms. And the problem with a lot of the prophetic, I said it last week here yeah, in the same place, prophet so-and-so's ministries. I ask the question, whose ministry is it? Is it Jesus Christ's ministry or the prophet's ministry? You want clarity, you want purity. The Spirit builds a kingdom to the glory of God. And let me, let me, let me share this. Something I've learned in my, in my life. When I give God the glory, I always have the benefits. You know, so when God blesses you with, I've got a business. When God blesses me with business and I get a nice huge deal. And it comes supernaturally. Because I didn't have, I prayed and God blessed me. I go, church knows, God blessed me with a big deal. God did supernaturally. But who do you think has the money? I've got the benefit of the finances. Yes, I give God his portion. 
I've got the benefit. But God gets the glory. And the prophetic always works like The prophetic never chases the benefits. It always chases God. If a prophet says, okay, sorry, this is my money I want to pay. I want you to pay 50,000 rand to get it. I'm sorry, sorry. Khanma. Not interested. So now I want to talk about two, two types of prophets. You know, you, in the Old Testament, you had two types of prophets. You had the prophets that sat at the king's table. And then you had the prophets who were called apart, set apart in the wilderness. So the prophets sitting at the king's table, when the prophetic sit at the king's tables, we are duly influenced by their dreams, their visions and plans. The seduction might not be intentional, but the influence on what we perceive and pray for is immensely impacted and affected. If I'm in a pastor's church and he's, we're going to take Durban for Jesus, we're going to take, as a prophet, what's on my heart? We're going to take Durban for Jesus. So when I get any other prophetic word that's counter that, do you think I'm really going to embrace that? I'm not going to, not easily. I need to be very mature to be able to distinguish between that and that. And now I come back to being called apart. It's not being out of the church in a cloister somewhere. But there needs to be a mentality that, Lord, I know that's the vision of the church. I know that's the plans. I know that's the purposes. But, Father God, what are you saying? Because if I had to ask the majority of Christians, how do they think the state of the church is in? What do you think the state of the church in America is like? They'll say, yes, it's going great. I mean, look at all the programs on TBN. Look at those mega churches. Look at the things that they do. And then you start hearing about all those mega churches, some of them doing geofencing to get other members from other churches to bring the type to their church. And then you start realizing that the church in America, when you look at stats, is actually in decline. The church globally is growing by 1.08%. So we are growing better than the human population, which is great. But the majority of it is happening in the south, not in the north. So I ask you, what's the condition of the church? What's the condition of your church? What does God say? Not what does the pastor say. What does God say? Can you understand when I talk about clarity? I'm not talking about a spirit of rebellion. It's not what I'm talking about. But when God drops something in your heart, that you'll have the courage to go to the pastor and say, Pastor, I don't know. I submit this to you. But this, he knows. He submits to me. But if he brought any hard word to me, would you? He would. Because I embrace it, I'll accept it. Because I, as a pastor, am that in function, not in position. And because he's a prophetic word, if God speaks through him, and I say, who are you? I'm the pastor. What am I doing? I'm actually elevating myself higher than the very voice of God. So when I talk about sitting at the king's table, it's not about saying hurrahs, it's about saying, Lord, what are you saying? Because you know what, I've been a pastor for many years. Pastors make mistakes. Pastors hear wrong. Pastors sometimes do things wrong. I wonder if I should say something. I can get into trouble. I can get into trouble. Pastors don't always know who's in their churches. So where's the prophets to understand and, and, and see when there are wrong people in churches? Recently, I had to go to a pastor and I had to tell him, do you know there's somebody that's actively involved in witchcraft that's teaching your children? So I'm asking, where's the pastors? Where's the prophets? Not the pastors. Where's the prophets? I did my homework, found the person put my phone in videotape because I love God's church so my question is where are the prophets 
We are influenced because we sit at the king's table. And I don't mean it in a disrespectful way. It's easy. I mean, we're family. So we sit together and we do our thing together. And without us understanding, sometimes we don't hear that clear. Especially if you're still growing up in the prophetic. But God is looking for people that are set apart. People that sit in the wilderness. It refers to a mindset that's not influenced by the world around me. This speaks of a mindset that hungers for the undiluted, accurate heart and word of God. It's time that the prophetic starts yearning and asking for it. And when the prophetic gets at that place, that they speak with a purity. I don't even know how many minutes I've got. Please help me. How much? Five. Oh. When we get to that place where we search for God, I, I, I spoke to somebody, I don't know who, no, last day or two. I said we as Christians need to have a Pasquabura Baba, what's that in English? Newborn baby mentality that yearns for its mother's breast. And that says, without the milk that I get from my mama, I will not survive. That is how we need to become. Emptying ourselves. Setting ourselves apart for God's use. I'm going to not do any of those. But I want to talk to you. The condition of the church. We are building kingdoms that often doesn't reflect the heartbeat of God. But God wants to do something powerful. And maybe you don't have a pastor that can listen to you because, let's be honest, the prophetic in most churches have been sidelined. But I want to read to you what James Byrne said. The period immediately preceding a widespread spiritual awakening is generally characterized by a profound sense of dissatisfaction awakening in many hearts. A weariness and exhaustion invade the heart and pleasures of the world no longer satisfy. Sick in soul, men turn with a sigh to God. Dimly they awake the consciousness that in bartering for earthly joys, they have encountered immeasurable loss. Slowly this aching grows. The heart of man begins to cry out for God, for spiritual certainties, for fresh vision. From a faint desire, this multiplies as it widens until it becomes a vast human need until in its urgency it seems to beat with violence at the very gates of heaven this often starts with a prophet or the prophetic who pick up what God is saying and as we encounter and we start seeing what God is seeing we start praying and interceding and seeking God's face and saying, Lord, I pray for my church. We want revival. I sometimes go and sit at churches in the back. I always like to sit in the back. Because you see everything. And then I weep. Because I see the people around me singing amazing songs that never open their Bibles. And they come Sunday after Sunday to church. <coughs> what did you say? When you were at our church, you said people, uh, I'll go listen to it, they, you said the two things are people. They are, are of no consequence. You can't remember. It was under the anointing. <laughs> they have no effect in the church. They are there, but they have no effect in the church because they are spiritually immature. Yeah. And I want to conclude... Who's heard of the boy prophet? Who's heard of the boy prophet? He was from Russian origin. 
And I want to show you how a boy prophet has an effect not only on the nation, but on the whole world. He had a remarkable history. His Russian origin, his family being among the first Pentecostals to come, come across the border. This was in the 1800s. Setting permanently in Karakara. From the earliest childhood, he had a gift for prayer and fasting. At the age of 11, he had heard that the Lord called him once again to prayer vigils. This time, he persisted for seven days and nights, 11. And during this time, received a vision. This in itself was not extraordinary. Indeed, his grandfather often would say, if you fast for so long, you go delusional, you'll see visions. <laughs> but what he was able to do during those seven days was not easy to explain. He started receiving visions and he started writing down these things. He was illiterate and he wrote down all the symbols and stuff and drew the maps that he saw. And then what happened when he presented it to the people, they saw it was in perfect Russian. And it was a warning. At some unspecified time in the future, the boy wrote, every Christian in Kara Kata would be in terrible danger. He foretold the time of unspeakable tragedy for the entire area where hundreds of thousands of men, women and children would be brutally murdered. The time would come, he warned, when everyone in the region was, must flee at the age of 11. They must go and find the land across the sea. And although he had never seen the geography book, the boy prophet drew a map showing exactly where the fleeing Christians were to go and it was the Americas. And then at the age of 54, I think it was, he said, now's the time to flee. And they did. In 1914, the Turkish marched in into Armenia and they took two million Christians into the desert, murdering and killing them. Many Christians in the desert wrote on stones and said, we did not deny Christ. But so many were murdered. But these Armenian Christians, when they went to America, they were in the same city where the Azusa Street Revival broke out in 1906. One prophet hearing from the Lord at the age of 11 impacted, saved thousands upon thousands of Christians but not only that, was also instrumental when those Armenians went to America, that they played a part in the Azusa Street Revival, which then shook the whole world. Don't undervalue the prophetic. Don't undervalue what you can do. If you speak the voice of God, you can influence Kings, you can influence pastors, and if they don't listen, they will be accountable unto the Lord. And God will move you where you need to go. So I'm yet to tell you, the prophetic is alive. The prophetic is necessary. The prophetic needs to find its place. In Ephesians 2 verse 20, as I read it many times, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles, and the prophets, with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. It's time for the prophets to get their voice and to speak the direction and the word of God to the church. We don't do doctrine. It's not what we do. But we do direction. We speak clarity. We bring conviction. And we bring change. Can we pray? Father, we just want to honor you. It's all for Jesus Christ. To build his kingdom. It's all for Jesus Christ. There's no man or, man or woman. Whose name is important. The only name that's important. Is Jesus Christ. And I want to pray right now. Father God. That you will raise up. The prophetic. A new clarity. Singular in vision. To only speak what you say. 
as purely as you actually give it to us. That we can impact our churches, that we can help guide by direction, and we can help establish your kingdom. I want to pray, Father God, as these men and women are faithful in doing what you call them to do. Father God, that your authority, your anointing will mark them. That when others look at them, they will know God spoke. I pray for that in Jesus' name. We honor you. We bless you. And all the saints say, Amen. 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 Wow. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much. That is amazing. And that is a powerful word. And uh, with such clarity and challenging us, especially to, to, to play our role and to know uh, the purity and the centricity of where we must stand. And, um, and we are going to have a session now to have a breakout session. Um, I'll just give you some guidance uh, on how we're going to do it. Um, we, get, we have five uh, sessions, uh, prophetic sessions, and uh, each of these we have um, prophetic healing. It's one session, which is going to be hosted by uh, Ricardo. We have a prophetic word, which is going to be hosted by Tyron and Big. We have a healing, hearing the voice of God, uh, which is going to be hosted by Mark and Robin. And we are going to have presenting your prophetic word by Hilton. We're going to have revelation, revelatory gifts by Moy and Tanya. So because there are so many of us to allow to be able to engage in those the thinking was to have it in different places. Some of us may need to move to the other room and have be hosted. And some are going to remain in this room. So it's not going to be too much of a hassle. And I think there was a thinking whether are we going to have in in one room here. Um, but let me just give me a one second to confirm. Right? Just give me one second. Let me get my co-host Mpo to, to help me confirm. So while um, we are going through the just uh, process, which one we are going to go to? So the idea is we are going to, in those five, you are going to choose which one you are going to go to. Uh, we are going to have 20 minutes, and then after that you are going to go to the next one. So meaning that you will have opportunity to attend uh, all the sessions. So just give me a second while I confirm how we are going to do it. This is what this is what you're going to do. Uh, the group that is present. So there, there are five people at the back who will have the different groups. So if you go up there, they are going to take you to where you are going to be. So let me read them again so that you can remember them. Uh, prophetic healing. Who is prophetic healing? Can you just maybe turn if you can turn the back? And then we've got a prophetic word. Where's prophetic word? Where's prophetic word? Um, healing, hearing the voice of God. There's hearing the voice of God. Presenting your prophetic word. Where's presenting the... 
There they are. Revelatory gifts. They are revelatory gifts. Okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> just, to, just, to, just to simplify the whole thing and make others understand, maybe there are some people who is their first experience about breakaway. So when we break away, we are trying to reach out to as many people as we can. So if you need a prophetic healing, like healing in your body, someone is sick, deliverance or impartation or being part of that, can you raise your hand where you are? Uh, the one that, I know the paper, the one that is going to be leading that. Ricardo. Okay. And then, then the, 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 the other one. <laughs> Tyron, can you raise your hand over there? Prophetic weight, you need a weight from the Lord. You need to hear what God is saying one-on-one, one-on-one. -on -one, one -on -one. They'll be prophesying one-on-one -on -one individually. It's like one person, you know, at a time. It's Tyron and uh, Mr. P. Kim Kwanazi. I think they are also pairing up. No, it's not. Robin, Robin, they are there. So there are three people there. It's Robin, Vilmian, and then Tyron, there are four people in that room. So what will happen, 20 minutes, you, you can be in that one. And then we exchange, and other people will, will, will come in. Is that clear? And then, the last one. There is this one. Presenting the prophetic word. Yeah, present. Okay. Hilton. Can you raise your hand? Season, prophet, apostle, pastor, you know, a lot. There are a lot of questions you can ask, and it's going to be equipping us on how you hear the word of the Lord, but how can you present it in a manner that it will speak a language to the setting and it will be relevant to the setting? So, you, 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 he's there to help us and equip us in that area. You know, sometimes you have a way you heard from the Lord, but the manner you, you present it is not acceptable. So it's going to be helping us in that area. And then there's going to be Tanya. Tanya, word, revelatory, word of wisdom. It's like one-on-one, -on -one, but you, they, it's, it's specific. They, there will be a session on word of knowledge, and there will be a session on word of wisdom. So if you have received the word of knowledge, you can leave the room and attend the other groups and then allow other people to get a chance as well. It's 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and then that will be the ending. Otherwise, the Lord is good. Okay, so Hilton's group remains here. The ones following Ricardo, please take a seat with you while you follow Prophet. prophetic healing